Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this live stream. I'm going to give it a, a minute or so to let people start coming in. Uh, let me know if my audio is garbage because I have no idea. I'm not listening to myself. For those of you who are wondering what exactly this live stream is going to be, it is going to be about uh, 18 USC 795 and the practical application of it. And the debate is supposed to be with Rocker T. Uh, you guys are correct who are saying that in the chat. Yes, Rocker T is someone who has been uh, commenting on a few of my videos. And I've been having discussion with them for a while about uh, this particular law and some of the evidence surrounding its uh, applicability. I, I want to say I became frustrated, but I had to repeat a lot of information. Uh, they kept asking the same questions. They were ignoring information. They were misrepresenting information. And so I decided finally, after uh, quite a while, <laughs> it's literally golden audio. I like it. Uh, after, after a while, I eventually went, you know what? I've been doing a few live streams recently. I might as well invite them to be part of a live debate, since that's something that I am interested in doing in the future, particularly with uh, sovereign citizens. So why not start here? Uh, in an area that I have a lot of expertise uh, as someone who was military police, 18 U.S.C. 795, which is the statute that prohibits the filming, photography, uh, graphical representation, creation of uh, restricted military installation, uh, something that I have enforced. I've never made an arrest for it, but I have enforced it. Um, it was The first video on my channel was about this, so I figured, eh, why not revisit it just for fun? So, uh, I have... I have Rocker in my Discord. I believe they are uh, here and ready to go. So I'm going to unmute them in just a second. We haven't spoken yet. I, I gave them the Discord link last night, and we, uh, we have had zero <laughs> communication with each other since they actually entered the Discord. So uh, once again, for those of you who are just joining in, the main topic of this debate is going to be regarding the legality of filming a restricted military installation particularly on someone who is outside of DOD property. Now, during this conversation between myself and Rocker, I don't want you to think that at any time I'm trying to insult them or demean them or anything like that. Uh, if you feel that I am doing that, please call me out on it because all I want to do is to help them and all of you understand uh, basically how this law is enforced. Okay. Now, I've had a discussion about this. I've released a few videos, Merb and myself, Merb Beast, uh, or as I like to call him, Merb 34th Street, just because I had no idea what his name was when I first saw it. Uh, Merb Beast. Uh, we've had a couple videos back and forth about this. And I enjoy doing that. I figured, why not do it live with someone uh, who has brought up some concerns about the applicability of this law. So, with that being said... Let's unmute him. Let's see what happens. And let's hopefully uh, we'll be able to hear him or her. I actually don't even know their gender. All right. I'm in the Discord. Rocker, are you there? Let me make sure my all my settings are correct first. Voice and video, my input device. Oh, let's put a microphone in there. All right. And, oh goodness, that. All right. I think that works. I think that works. Checking it out. All right, Rocker, are you there? Maybe not. They, uh, Rocky, if you're there, uh, if you join the general voice channel under my, um, on, on my Discord, let me send them a message. <laughs> you will need to join the general voice channel. Alright, message sent. Anyway, 
while we wait for that to happen. How are all of you? And now we play the waiting game. I was going nasty, Nathaniel. Hard Steve, of course. Good to see you, Humberto. You're here often. Good to see you back, Gary. The rest of you. Since, uh, oh, oh, we got a response. We got a response. Uh, you need to click on the general button on the left to join the voice chat. How was my week? My week was pretty good. Uh, nothing too crazy happened. Uh, da, da, da. I don't know. It was just, just a normal week. Uh, obviously, I've been doing a lot more live streaming because I have a, a live stream set up, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, oh, he's still... All right. He's present. Or she. Again, I have no idea. We haven't interacted on the voice channel yet. <clears throat> and you might think, oh, why, why wouldn't you make sure this is set up? Well, I like a bit of mystery. I like a bit of excitement. And I want to do this live live, where we just, just do what we want, see what happens. You know, there we go. Rocker, are you there? If you are... I can't hear you. Let me see if, uh... I'm not seeing anything coming through a microphone, Rocker, if you're planning on talking uh, with your voice. How's it going, South Star? All right, that's fine. Just some microphone issues, folks. Not a problem. Discord has this habit of changing settings sometimes. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I've certainly had issues. I know, what's up with Eric Brandt? But there's more to be sentenced on. There's more for him to be sentenced on if he gets that sentence. Uh, so we, uh, we'll we see how that continues. That might not be the end of his sentencing, or it might be. But um, Eric Brandt, he pushed the envelope. He thought he had the right to do a thing that he apparently didn't have the right to do. And of course he can appeal it, and he might uh, he might get his conviction overturned. But... He, having seen his content, I am not surprised. Uh, based on my own knowledge and interpretation of the law. So, hey, Rocker's saying he just got a new computer, and so he just had to set up some microphone stuff. That's perfectly fine. Not an issue. I have been there. Nasty Nathaniel, you and the rest of the internet. Uh, once I released that DeWitt video, uh, things kind of started. Uh, exploding. All right, any news on our favorite psychopath, Jeremy DeWitt? Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the video of him with the ambulance. Uh, that's certainly interesting. Uh, aren't these great? I got this specifically for this uh, this video, these uh, these, little, these little blue shirts, uh, and I enjoyed it. Uh, seeing it, I thought, wouldn't this be fun to wear on my channel? And so I have very often. Uh, yeah, so Jeremy DeWitt, I don't know if there's anything new with his actual his current uh, case against him but more videos are coming out from the real world police channel uh, which are always a lot of fun to see because it just there's so much there's so much weirdness going on with that guy I, I couldn't believe the ambulance one was real either. Uh, and I thought, oh, it's just someone else using the name. Um, oh, no, the ambulance one is, is actually him. He's actually running uh, a private ambulance. And I don't know if he actually runs an ambulance business or if he just, like, partnered with the WWE and they provided one to him temporarily or what. I have no idea. But uh, I guess the driver of the ambulance was charged with being unlicensed. I guess his license had been revoked, his driver's license, because he had failed to pay uh, child support. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to check that. I'm pretty sure that's what I read. 
Um, so, I mean, that's probably charged him with driving while license suspended. And he might not have known that his license was suspended. He might not have gotten a heads up. But that is something that happens if you've been tasked with paying a fine and you don't do it. There are states where they will then suspend your license. So it's uh, certainly interesting. So I don't, I don't think their license... I mean, the fact... if he's, I don't know if they're driving it on a public roadway with those lights on. But that could be issues. There are a lot of issues that could stem from that. I haven't looked extensively into it. Um, but no, it's it's that video was real, uh, hard to see. Uh, I, I'm interested as well uh, about finding out whether or not there's something going on with, with a mental issue, with the, the need to be a, an authority figure. And they might bring it up as a defense. I doubt it. I don't think it's going to be a strong enough defense. Because generally, if you're going to claim the, the mental illness defense, it has to be pretty significant. But, yeah, purple and amber lights are okay for a funeral. But if someone says, oh, that's an ambulance, and they have their lights on, I have to move out of their way. And they're not licensed to be an ambulance company or, or a medical company. That's uh, that's good. Ah, oh, Desert Sentinel is dead. It's good to see you. Uh, love your videos. Because you keep me up to date on what's going on. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with Desert Sentinel is dead, uh, go check them out because they uh, he does a, a really good job of keeping track of all the, the cases against auditors and what's going on with those. I know who some of you are. Yeah. You'd... Th I mean, I... You're saying that he doesn't have a history of mental illness, Humberto. Uh, it's, I mean, he has a history of criminal behavior, uh, probably untreated, uh, if there is a mental illness. And that's assuming there is a mental illness that drives him to need to be an authority figure. It certainly seems unusual, his desire to, to be in charge and to have authority over people. Uh, is it mental illness? I don't know. <laughs> but... Yeah, for, for a defense, you usually want uh, a past history. It's going to be easier. It's not necessary, but it will be definitely easier if he decides to use it as, as a defense. I don't think he will. Um, but who knows? I'm going to be watching that case with a lot of interest. Uh, no, Ricky, he's uh, Rocker is still here. Uh, he's typing to me right now. Uh, just some microphone issues. Yeah, I'd love to see a video of DeWitt just sticking his head of, out of a window and making siren noises. That would make me very happy. Wait. I think I'm being talked to by Rocker. My headphones turned themselves off. Rocker, are you there? Oh, that's good to know. I'm not super familiar with the uh, insanity defenses, Merb. Uh, oh, I hear you. I hear you, Rocker. Hold on. Let me see if I can up your audio real quick. Uh, all right. How are you doing, Rocker? I hear you. Does uh, does everyone in the chat hear him? How is... I hear you. Do you hear me? All right. We don't hear him. Uh, da, da, da. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's it's real quiet. Let me see if I can adjust my audio. Uh, da, da. open sound settings. Nope, that's not what I want. It's the first time we've ever tried this, guys. So bear with me. Okay, uh, Rocker, we should be able to hear you. A little better now. All right, yeah, I, I hear you. How are you, how's the chat? Is the chat hearing him a little better? Because I can up that just a little bit more. Sound no. Yeah, he is really quiet. But that might be my computer doing its thing. Oh, I've broken everything. 
Okay. It is. It, yeah, very quiet, very low. Uh, Rocker, if you're able to... I have your, your volume as high up as I can get it. Uh, so if you're able to turn things up on your end, that will uh, be useful. I say that, it's just... All right, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a little bit of static. Let's let's be nice in the comment section, folks. <laughs> What's that, Rocker? You're cutting in and out. I just have had the same problem. Huh. It's very strange. I'm not super sure what's happening. Uh, I'm getting no audio from Rocker at the moment. All right, he's typing. All right, all right. Um, Rocker has decided that uh, he will type and... Uh, I will talk. I'm not a huge fan of that because I feel like it puts you at a disadvantage. Um, but if, if that's your decision, that's totally fine. <clears throat> so. Uh, okay. All right, let's do this. Let's begin, folks. Um, I know, I know. We'll Maybe we'll try this again in the future. And... Uh, n uh, is anyone else typing? Uh, well, it's just you typing to me. You're the only one that um, I'm talking to directly. I may have the chat as well, but uh, as far as in the Discord. Sorry, I don't know if you guys can... So, you know what? I could probably get you guys a visual on what he's typing. Uh, and that way, you know I'm not just making up what he's saying. Stand by. Windows capture, yeah, yeah, yeah. Learning OBS in real time. And Discord. Woo, yeah, no. Okay, that didn't work. Got a little black. All right, I hear you. I hear you. Yes. Okay. I can. I can hear you now. Is it better? Yes. Right there. That is good. I hear oh. you. All right. Perfect. All right. <laughs> All right so, uh, let's begin this thing. Uh, this was. This is a, a debate about 18 U.S.C. 795 and its applicability. Uh, Merb is in the chat, and he and I have had debates in the past. So it will be interesting to see how he <laughs> responds to some of this stuff uh, and the things that I have to say. So. Yes. All right. Let me yeah, let me see if I can get my desktop audio a little higher for you. Um, yeah. If if you if you just talk loudly loudly, I think we we shouldn't have issues. But uh, regarding 18 USC 795, my position on this topic is that it can be enforced on someone that is filming from outside of DOD property. Uh, your position is that it can't be enforced on someone who is filming outside of DOD property. That they I believe that they have to be on DOD property. And before we discuss this, uh, I do want to uh, bring up 18 U.S.C. 795 and give uh, an explanation of exactly what it is. So I'm going to read it to you guys. Uh, so 18 U.S.C. 795, Photographing and Sketching Defense Installations. It is a federal uh, statute, and it states that whenever in the interest of national defense, the president defines certain vital military and naval installation, installations or equipment as requiring protection against the general dissemination of information relative thereto, it shall be unlawful to make any photograph, sketch, picture, drawing, map, or graphical representation of such vital military and naval installations or equipment without first obtaining permission of the commanding officer of the military or naval, or naval post, camp, or station, or naval vessels, military and naval aircraft, or any separate military or naval command concerned, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, 
And then it has, if you do take those photographs, how to promptly submit them for censorship if necessary. Um, I will, let me, let me get out of your way so you guys can see that real quick. Because I don't want you to think that uh, he is. Why, why are you not able to, what? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, no one else is typing. Um, we're just talking through this. Uh, the typing is going on in the my live stream. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, no, it's just us in here. Uh, I haven't released, this is the first time I've, I've had this Discord uh, sent to anyone. This is my, for the, for the record, guys, this Discord is called the Pork Pow Wow. I thought that was a fun little play on words. Anyway, I'll release it. Why not? Uh, one of these days, I'll, I'll let everyone in. Um, but, all right, so that's 18 U.S.C. 795, and I'm sure you have the concern, or many people have the concern, well, how do we know what the president defines as certain vital military and naval installations? Uh, this has led a lot of people to believe that there is some list out there of which bases get protection. There is not, because we have Executive Order 10104, which was created in 1950. That was two years after 18 U.S.C. 795 was established. It was established by President Truman, and it, it explains 18 U.S.C. 795, explains 18 U.S.C. 797, which is the publication of photos of military installations, and then it goes into what is defined as a vital military and naval installation or equipment requiring protection against the general dissemination of information relative thereto. Uh, all military, naval, or air force installations and equipment which are now classified, designated, or marked under the authority or at the direction of the President, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of the Navy, or the Secretary of the Air Force as top secret, secret, confidential, or restricted, and all military, naval, or air force installations and equipment which ha may hereafter be so classified, designated, or marked with the approval or at the discretion of the President and then located within any military, naval, or air force reservation, post, arsenal, proving ground, range, mine, field, camp, base, airfield, fort, yard, station, district, or area. Uh, and then it goes on about what would be naval, what would be air force, uh, harbors, that sort of thing. And then here we have what various equipment. And then we have here naval, or air force, books, pamphlets, documents, so on and so forth. Now, um, there's a lot of information here. And feel free to pull it up on your own. It is Executive Order 10104 if you want to follow along a little bit better than whatever I have going on here. But the important thing to notice is that all military, naval, air force installations equipment classified or designated or marked under the authority of the President, the Secretaries of the Armed Forces, or the Secretary of Defense as secret, top secret, confidential, or restricted. Now, uh, Merb has had the argument, and I'll, I'll get to our argument in just a second, Rocker, but I do want to establish... Uh, some things in case people don't know uh, much about this. Uh, Merv and I have discussed whether or not restricted counts. Uh, he has come up with the idea that restricted is no longer a classification of information, uh, which is sort of true. It is still used for nuclear material, um, and there is still stuff referred to as formerly restricted, which um, is what would have been restricted, because restricted is no longer a classification for the most part of... Uh, documents. Now, the question becomes, is a military installation a document, is a restricted military installation a document, or can restricted be applied as a classification to an area? And then you come up with the, the, the question of, well, it doesn't have to just be classified, it can also be uh, marked or designated. So it, something has been designated as restricted, does that count as a restricted area? At which point, we know that it does because of the history of how this has been enforced. Uh, so if that comes up, we will absolutely discuss it, and it is fairly complicated. I know I'm not doing a great job of discussing it, but there are some semantics in here because this is, you know, 70 years old that don't quite apply to today, but the way they are enforced in modern times does sort of clarify it. And we can get into that uh, in this debate, but I don't want to. I don't want to spend too long not talking to Rocker here. Uh, Rocker, you seem to think that 18 U.S.C. 795 cannot be applied to uh, public property, for someone filming from public property. And there's nothing in the, the statute or executive order that establishes that. So I'm curious to know, and I have an idea of 
you know, why you think this based on our previous discussion. Uh, but I'd like to know why you think that this would not be applicable to someone on public property. I hear you. Mm, yes. Right. I'm going to put you on pause, Rocket. You're breaking up a little bit. It's it's kind of hard to follow. I don't know if uh, it's just a connection issue or uh, if maybe the microphone isn't picking you up too well. Um, Let me try not to move this mic so much. Oh, here we go. Yeah, now I can hear you a lot better. Yeah, I'm moving it around. The actual headphone I'm using. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that might, that might be part of the problem. So, yeah, you brought up uh, Genevieve's. I mean, I brought up Genevieve's earlier, and then uh, you've brought it up now. And... That's great because Genovese is a really interesting case. Um, I have it up here. I have part of it. So um, to tell everyone else what the Genovese case is, Gen- Genovese versus the town of Southampton. So uh, Genovese, I believe it was 2009 that she was arrested, although this is from 2013. Um, she was outside of a an airbase. It was a, uh, a public airport slash uh, like National Guard airbase, and she was taking pictures of a helicopter display. An off-duty police officer, uh, who's on vacation at the time, saw her taking pictures while on a public road and uh, followed her. She turned onto a road that led to the airport, and he was trying to get her to stop. He was trying to flag down security. Uh, No one noticed him doing either of these things, so he pulled her over, uh, detained her for taking photographs. Uh, There was something about her having a gun in the car, which wasn't incredibly relevant. They did seize it, and she tried to sue them for unlawfully seizing um, uh, her her firearm because she had just come back from a, a shooting range, uh, so there were concerns that she might be like entering this airport with a firearm illegally. But it, it didn't really matter. So this guy detained her for taking these photographs, uh, called up the local police department and said, "Hey, uh, I've detained this person, but I'm on vacation. Can someone take my place? I'm not really interested in, you know, working on my day off." So another member of the police, it was um. Deputy Sheriff Robert Carlock, I believe, who showed up, who was um, the the person most involved in this. He showed up, and he ended up arresting Genovese for trespass. Now, it later came up in the case that uh, the arresting, or the detaining officer, the original guy, uh, Robert Iberger, had never said that she had trespassed. And it had only been like, hey, she's, uh, she's photographing this place. And he had been trained in... Um, 
he was a police officer with special training in oh, what was it? It was counterterrorism, I believe. He had uh, special training in counterterrorism, so he was familiar with 18 U.S.C. 795. And went, hold on a second, this violates this statute. Detained her while she was on a, a public road, or certainly not while she was inside the restricted area of the airfield, which did come up. Uh, and so there was no reason to believe that she had trespassed. Uh, he never told the officers that uh, replaced him that she had trespassed. Uh, but she still got arrested for trespassing because uh, Carlock thought for some reason that that was the, the whole purpose of the detention. They held her in a, a cell for four days and then released her and said, oops, sorry about that. She finally, uh, she finally got released and then sued the department and sued the city for like, what on earth is happening? You violated my First Amendment rights. You violated my Fourth Amendment rights. You've unlawfully held me in a cell. Uh, what on earth is happening? And was, this case is really interesting because no one responded to her. Uh, she filed this and no one got back to her. So she filed a 50 million default uh, summary judgment saying, if you do not respond to this, you will owe me $50 million. At which point, yeah, they've responded to her. And uh, it turns out the person who was supposed to respond thought they did, but they had two deaths in the family that week. And it was this whole complicated thing. So she almost got away with getting $50 million. Uh, she ended up getting awarded $1.112 million, which was dropped down to 700000 So she did win money. But did she win money because she was unlawfully detained for filming no she won money because she was unlawfully arrested for trespassing which had never occurred and it turns out in the court case there was no reason to believe that uh she had trespassed so it was 100 percent an unlawful arrest now as far as the idea that it was an unlawful detention well they brought that up to the judge and let me see if i can pull that up here Let's see. With respect to the false arrest claim, it is undisputed that on July 30th, 2009, plaintiff was taking photographs of a vital defense installation. Based upon that undisputed evidence, there was probable cause for Lieutenant Eiberger, who was the uh, guy who initially detained her, uh, to conclude that plaintiff had violated 18 U.S.C. 795, which makes it a crime to photograph a vital military installation. In fact, following oral argument, plaintiff acknowledged that there is nothing to oppose the applicability of 18 U.S.C. 795 in this matter. And that comes from a letter from Nancy uh, Genovese's uh, attorney. She had two attorneys. Uh, one had, I think, a couple decades of experience. The other one was fairly new. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, that part right there, that, that's kind of where I'm trying to... Right. Yes. No, it does not. Right, and you're not...
prosecutor probably sit there and say, you know what? There's no way I can determine the court ball. That's fair. Well, yes, it it's yes and no that applies, and we can discuss that with the uh, the Toledo, Toledo Blade incident. That's very relevant, Privacy Protection Act. Um, but I do want to uh, touch on a few things because you do get, bring up a good point that no one has been convicted that I know of, uh, or that anyone has been able to tell me. And no one's been convicted of filming a restricted military installation from uh, public property. However, no one's been acquitted either. So that's why there is such a, a great amount of debate. And we, we will discuss that. I do want to say a few more things about Genevieve's. Uh, regarding the oral arguments, you are correct that we don't know exactly what those oral arguments were. I don't know if they were um, put on any sort of record. I haven't been able to find them. Uh, but we have uh, the letter by Nancy Genovese to, uh, to the judge. And that letter comes from her attorneys. After a careful review of this matter, including legal research and discussions with your honor during oral argument, we respectfully wish to advise your honor that there is nothing to oppose the applicability of 18 U.S.C. 795 in this matter. Which sort of brings up the question of why weren't they able to find anything. Uh, but you do bring up the point, do we know if she was on public or private property when she was filming? And I believe she did enter base property. She didn't go into the restricted area, which was a point of contention. However, we do have uh, an article here. It says the indisputed facts at trial were that under Sheriff Carlick initiated charges based upon his observation of plaintiff on a public road. Now, that public road may have been on base property. We don't know. I don't know. I don't have the exact coordinates of where this happened. Uh, unfortunately, this is Carla. Yeah, this is the one who arrested her, not just detained her. Um... Carlock initiated charges based upon his observation of plaintiff on a public road leading towards an airbase. Carlock himself testified at trial that plaintiff never entered the airbase and was never within any kind of fenced area. That's important because the specific uh, trespassing charges they charged her with would have required her to have crossed the fence line or known that she was in an area that wasn't uh, public. There would have had to be signs that say that specifically outside of this fence line, this is not public, or she would have had to enter... It was Iberger that made contact. It was Carlock that made the arrest after Iberger had left. Uh, yeah. Now, Carlock is the one that actually got, you know, sued uh, that didn't have qualified immunity because it says, uh, moreover, Carlock testified that he did not know where the airbase's property line was. Similar, similarly, uh, Lieutenant Iberger, who initially stopped plaintiff for taking photographs outside the base, testified that he never told Carlock or any other law enforcement official that plaintiff had trespassed. That's huge. That's that's really what did it. Because originally, Carlock was like, oh, no, I totally, I totally had reason to believe that she trespassed. And then during the case, he eventually went, oh, yeah, oh, I guess he never did tell me that she trespassed. I just made this assumption. Uh, he had built up a story in his head, and maybe he believed it, and he just, but upon questioning, he went, oh, gosh, you know what? You're right. I I didn't have reason to believe. And he was, uh, yeah. Exactly. So under these circumstances, the court concludes that the jury recently found that Carlock lacked probable cause to believe that plaintiff has had trespassed. Uh, 
So that was a whole thing. So yes, this is this is not a uh, a criminal case. Genevieve was never charged with violating 18 U.S.C. 795, but the judge did say that the officers had probable cause to believe that she did. So this gives the idea that police have the ability to arrest you or detain you for filming a restricted military installation. Will you get charged with it? Will you get? I'm sorry. Yes, you'll get charged with it. Will you get convicted for it? That's still up for debate. But again, nobody has been acquitted of it either. So there is no case law either way. In a higher court of law, yes, it, whether or not this is constitutional will come into question. However, so far, it has never successfully uh, been contested. It, or, or it's never really succeeded. As a police officer, my point of view is if I'm able to arrest someone for it, it is an unlawful activity. Now, someone like Merb argues that uh, until you're convicted, it's not unlawful. And that just comes from we have two different perspectives. I enforced law. He made sure that uh, it was applied correctly within the court system. So the question is, is very real whether or not you will be convicted. However, until there is case law that establishes that this, uh, there are limits to this, uh, to this statute or that remove the statute entirely, it is still an active law. And it will, you know, there will be issues. Now, with Freeman, for example, do you, I hear you. Do you hear me? Oh, okay. I thought not my, I lost my mic there for a second. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. No, you're back. You're back. Uh, we, we have discussed uh, James Freeman. Also, uh, his real name is James Springer. Uh, regarding how courts review this. Uh, and that's a really interesting case. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, I think it was... 2018, yeah, 20 March 2018, uh, James Springer, who goes by the YouTube channel uh, named James Freeman, was uh, arrested while filming the access control point of uh, Fort Huachuca. And I can actually read the, the, the filing to you. It was filed by Elizabeth Strange, first assistant U.S. attorney within the District of Arizona, and Bradley Bauer, uh, special assistant United States attorney, who worked for the base, I believe. And they filed the following document uh, on or about 20 March. You know what? I can pull it up for you guys, I think. Let me see if I can, I can pull that up. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I will read it to you. I just... Good, all right. Um... Let's see. On or about 20 March 2018 on Fort Huachuca, a federal military reservation within the District of Arizona, James Springer did intentionally audio and visually record an access control point at an entrance to Fort Huachuca in violation of 18 U.S.C. 795, a federal Class A misdemeanor. It can get him up to uh, a year in prison, so 364 days in prison, maximum charge. <laughs> I bet the defect sucks, I'll monitor. Sorry, someone's saying that they've been to Fort Huachuca and the food is terrible. Uh, so this is the filing against him, saying that he did this thing. Um, Freeman, uh, his defense, it didn't really, it wasn't really that he hadn't violated that statute. It was just that the statute couldn't be applied to him because there wasn't signage telling him not to film. So, uh, from there, uh, let me see if I can pull up this file. No, I cannot. Um, I don't have that file, but I can read it to you. I have the quote. And I can, I can send it to you guys if anyone requests it. It says, um, Mr. Springer is not disputing the base's right to impose reasonable time, place, or manner restrictions on the speech. Now, that's important because, yes, this statute restricts the freedom of press. However, there, is a court, there are a few court cases that establish that restrictions can be made if they are reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions under certain conditions. So what this lawyer is saying that they're not debating the fact that this restriction can be made, but they're saying that um, if the public is not made aware of these restrictions, for example, on filming, uh, they are invalid. So if time, place, and manner restrictions are vaguely enforced, they do not apprise the public of the restricted nature of an area. Prosecution for exercising First Amendment activities under 18 U.S.C. 795, 18 U.S.C. 797, and 18 U.S.C. 1382 is unconstitutional. Those are all three things that he was charged with. Uh, I think there were four charges that were brought against him. Um, but he was charged with 795, which is filming, 795, which is publication, and uh, 1382, which is trespassing. So he was charged. He, yes, he was, he was charged. He was not convicted. He was charged with all of these things. I think, I, I want to say there was a fourth. Uh, I think the fourth charge was. Yes. Uh, so. 
that is that is uh, a contentious thing, uh, the time, place, and manner, because there isn't. It's very situationally dependent uh, whether or not these uh, time, place, and manner restrictions are reasonable. So the argument isn't that they can't be made; it's just what is reasonable. And when it comes to national defense, uh, it became it becomes it, it's a whole other ball game because national defense is. It really comes down to the argument that the lawyers make in court. So Merv and I can argue this all day, but until it's actually brought to court in front of a judge and the arguments are, are you know, put together in front of a judge and a determination is made, uh, I mean, I have my reasons for believing that these restrictions are reasonable based on my own knowledge about base security and enforcement. And Merb has his own belief based on um, how he has applied uh, the First Amendment protections. And so it really comes down to what will the argument be in court, which is why it's so important, and I, I, I am so focused on following these court cases, because no one's really gotten far enough to debate in front of a judge fully whether or not this statute is constitutional. Um, it either ends up in a civil case like the Genovese case, which doesn't really establish much, or it gets dismissed before trial, which is what happened with Freeman. Mm-hmm. That's true, and and that is fair. Uh, there's, I'm, you make the argument that a base is safer on uh, U.S. soil because you know what U.S. citizen is going to attack. Um, I mean, well, we had the Fort Hood shootings in 2009 where uh, 14 people were shot and 30 more were injured. Um, it was. Uh, yeah, who is a United States uh, citizen. So, so I mean... Sure. But why would you film if not for the intention of entering a base? Or for figuring out how to get in or finding uh, weaknesses? Wait, I'm sorry. What was the question? No, I'm sorry. Uh, what I was saying, the difference is you were talking about military. Someone is filming a base. Mm -hmm. Or just secret ways to get in, whatever. Service. Sure. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually watching on another computer because the live is throwing me off. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. Uh, you're hearing me well ahead of the live stream uh, by 5, 10 seconds. Okay. At least. Sure. 
fact, it was a van full of a bomb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now you've got all these people filming in Times Square. So are we going to sit there and say, well, you can't film Times Square because you could be a terrorist? You know, figuring out the ins and outs, how does the beach work, when is it clear to park the van there and blow up Times Square? Well, that's... That's a, that's a good point. Now, I mean, there's a lot more reason to film within Times Square than there is to film a restricted military installation. Um, and the, that 18 U.S.C. 795 was created, it was first established in 1938 as a congressional act and then made into a law in 1948. And it was basically, in 1938, it was created uh, to counter uh, the rise in European, um, I guess, nationalism? Like, w- with the Nazis and the everyone, the Italians, uh, fascism, that's the one. Uh, it was basically established because there was a perceived fascist threat against the United States. And they thought, well, we don't want people to be filming and photographing our equipment uh, if they're trying to attack us. Now, in 1948, it became about the Russians with communism. Uh, and so these laws are very much designed to be uh, to prohibit spying or... Um, oh, there's a word I'm looking for. Uh, spying is... Yeah, it, I mean, it was it was the Cold War that it actually became a law, uh, but it was it was certainly existed during World War II as a congressional act. Uh, so uh, espionage, the word, it's basically an anti-espionage law. And uh, 18 U.S.C. 794, 795, 796, 797, uh, and I think maybe a couple others are specifically referred to as the anti-espionage uh, statutes uh, in some circles. So it's designed to prohibit that sort of thing. Now. With Google, yes, a lot of people bring up the, um, everyone's going, espionage, you idiot. That's the word, it's espionage. Um, with Google, yes, they take pictures. And in 2007, 2008, when, when Google Street View uh, started becoming a thing, there was a huge issue. Like, the, the government went, hold on a second, everyone stopped for a second. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to addressing the security issues and what is actually, you know, can be filmed by the public uh, that would be a security issue. But I do want to go into an article uh, from Reuters. If I pull that up right here. Boom. Uh, It's General Jean Renoir, head of the military command responsible for Homeland Defense, said the Pentagon had talked to Google about the risks and expected the company to cooperate in removing selected images from its Street View services. We have been contacted by the military, Google spokesman Larry Yu said. In those instances where they, the U.S. military, have expressed concerns about the imagery, we have accommodated their request. So there are times when Google absolutely uh, restricts what can be filmed. Now, it was determined by the uh, the government, all right, let's not restrict it too much. And that's really interesting. There's an article from Vice. Let me pull it up in case people are wondering, why isn't Google you know, completely stopped from doing this? And so this article is about the one place in the U.S. that Google Earth stopped mapping. It's about Area 51. And the article is a lot of fun. But the important part from it comes from uh, former CIA senior executive intelligence officer Michelle Brungraber, who wrote in a paper for the National War College, the argument was that it would be better to have U.S. contractors dominate the industry, end quote. And then the article goes on to say where the industry standard resolution and other points of concern could be regulated by federal law. So basically what that's saying is the government wanted the U.S. to have the best satellite imagery uh, that would be available to the public because attacks might come from the public. uh, And therefore, if they're using Google Images... Google Images is controlled by federal law, and if the United States wanted to step in and say, hey, this violates this federal law, for example, 18 U.S.C. 795, we want it taken away, then they can control that really easily. So, yes, Google does get some permission to film, but the resolution isn't great. If you go in and... Um, let's, you know what? Let's, let's look at Fort Huachuca, and I'll show you how good the... Um, resolution is from street view so i mean the resolution from above isn't bad if you see that i mean it's not great you can see where all the buildings are you can't see any i mean if you looked at you know you're not gonna like what kind of vehicle is this i have no idea so the resolution not great but if we go to uh street view here well there's nowhere for me to 
drop street view. That's, ah, yeah, so there's no street view on the base. You have to go all the way out here. Uh, where's the closest I can get? Closest I can get is probably right here. Is that the base? It's hard to tell. Stand by. We're going to figure this out. What's, how close can I get to Fort Wachuca? On street. Yeah, not close. I cannot get close to Fort Wachuca. Um, oh, Hatfield. Let's, yeah, yeah. Hatfield, I think, is where I want. Can I go over there? Let's see. Well, yeah, not great. So it's, it's, you can't see much of Fort Huachuca. Uh, oh, there's got to be a better location to do this. Unfortunately, not so much. I don't remember where Freeman was when he was filming. Anyway, let's, I don't know, let's look at, I don't know what other bases we want. Uh, there's Fort Hood, Fort Rucker, Fort Leonard Wood. I like Fort Leonard Wood. I trained in Fort Leonard Wood. That's a fun one. All right, so Fort Leonard Wood is a gosh darn miserable place. Yeah, again, you can't get too close with Street View. Uh, let's try right here. Oh, I remember. Yeah, you can't, you can't get close. There are bases where you can get close, but there are bases where you can't, uh, depending on how the base wants. Oh, man. I've been here. I've been in this exact location. Now that it matters. Anyway, just if you look here, here's Fort Leonard Wood. Here's the blue is where the street view works. You can't get too close. So they are limited. They do limit um, what can be seen. Okay, here's one I know you can get a little bit closer to. Uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord. They care a little bit less. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that. All right, let's go. Let's go right here. Oh goodness. All right, we. <laughs> I don't know where anything is. Yes, I just want to show that the resolution isn't great. All right, so here's here's one of the gates. Uh, this is, I think, the main gate. And so you can get you can get pretty close. Look at that. So we have uh, close enough. This is their visitor center, I believe. And you have the actual fence right here uh, behind us. So you can actually enter somewhat closely. Oh, we're getting kind of close here, aren't we? Is this main gate? I think this is main gate. This is as far as we can get. You can't see much, can you? Right? I can't, I can't see how many guards there are. I can't see what the guards are doing, what equipment they have. Um, this is as close as I can get. Now, if I was standing on this exact spot with a telephoto lens, I'd be able to see what the guards are. I mean, I used to you know, be an MP, so I know what the guards would carry. But I'd be able to see what their equipment was. Uh, you know, are they carrying rifles or just pistols? Do they have uh, mobile shields? Uh, what happens when there is a security incident? What... Uh, how many vehicles do they search? So it's not necessarily your ability to take a single photograph. A single photograph is not going to tell you anything. Like, what are you, what are you getting from this? But if you sit there for an hour and you start documenting how many vehicles going in and out, how many are searched, uh, why am I? <laughs> there we go. Um, what the procedures are? If there is a security concern, you're going to get a lot of information that would never be available to you on Google Maps. And yeah, it's only illegal if you're filming it or you're writing it down. But if you're planning an attack against on a military installation, you're going to want some documents. You're going to want paperwork. You want photos. You're going to need a pretty good plan to successfully attack a base. And if it's illegal to write that down, I mean, is that going to stop you? No. But is it going to make it easier to prosecute you for an attempted attack on a base? Yes. So that comes down to, is it reasonable to restrict this filming? It comes down to, is it reasonable to believe that anything is really going to be seen from Google Maps? Not so much, but is it reasonable to believe that someone could accumulate some pretty significant information regarding the security practices of a military installation if they were filming for an extended period of time? Yes, I would consider that reasonable. Wait, and that's there, sure. Right. Take 
can we worry about, I know, 18 U.S. and U.S. 795 here, associating that with terrorist activity, and that's why they put it Sure. But how is that any different, I'm just saying basically from a common sense standpoint, of somebody filming a police station, a fire station, a government office, Mm-hmm. No, he's still here. He's he's telling me I'm wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's uh. Sure. 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 Right. Sure. 
Yes, there is. Now I can I, I have I have a whole bunch of information on on the Freeman case and uh, I can tell you exactly why it's not going to be refiled, which I'm sure you'll be happy about. I do I I do want to address the um, yeah you're right you can film a uh, police station from public property something that you are prohibited by law from doing with a uh, military installation and uh, for those of you who are following along with uh, Mervin my dispute he has been in the chat and he's saying I'm wrong because you know I'm misrepresenting some, uh, uh, you know, intent or uh, intent being uh, mens rea, I believe. And then uh, the reasonableness test. We've discussed this in previous videos with each other. Uh, okay. I'm doing this live. Sorry if I have some, uh, some semantics, but it does come down to what is, is reasonable to a degree. That might not be the correct wording, but, um, uh, yeah, so you're not prohibited by statute from filming a police station. You are prohibited by statute from filming a, a military installation. I think part of that's because a military or a police station is not going to have uh, classified information. I mean, the the police reports are going to be uh, for official use only, if not, um, you know, marked in some way that prevents them from being disseminated to the public. Uh, but when it comes to military installations, there are, you know, class, there's classified information, 100%. Uh, some stuff that's pretty, you wouldn't want in the hands of just anyone. And certainly, I mean, if you filmed an attack against a police station, you bombed the police station, you invaded the police station, you killed everyone in it. Okay, Merv, that's, that's cute. Um, he, uh, if you killed everyone in there, cool. All right, everyone's dead. Sucks to be everyone involved. If you infiltrate a military installation successfully, well, now, what do you have? Do you... Yeah, I mean, but I mean, if you plan like a real attack, like because this, these are espionage laws. These are generally designed to prosecute people uh, acting on the, be the behalf of a country, right? Uh, so if a country decides to infiltrate and take a military installation, well, now they have your tanks, they have your guns, they have your missiles. They have your artillery. Uh, so the the threat against the United States, if someone were to do unlawful things with the what they're documenting, is much higher than they would if they invaded a police station, right? Uh, and that is a very good point, you know. Why can I film a police station on a military installation? I personally, I believe that they, they, they operate at different levels. Uh, uh, let me let me pause for a second. Uh, Merb has, is saying classified information can no longer be restricted. Uh, he's already admitted that he was wrong about that uh, in a debate. I, I sent him a video uh, explaining why he was wrong about that. So classification or information can be classified or restricted if it's nuclear data. Uh, however, the way that the statute is currently interpreted, restricted is uh, it doesn't have to be classified. It can be marked or designated. And so a restricted area is considered in every single application of 18 U.S.C. 795 um, as you know, restricted area as opposed to uh, classification of restricted data. So Merb is bringing up old points that have already been proven wrong. He's already admitted uh, were not correct. So if, any, okay. if anyone's wondering no, about... All right, so... He didn't fully admit I was right, but he submitted, he responded with a video, um, and the, it was the Latin legal term for um, admission of guilt, I think it was, was the name. And he said, oh, well, I guess maybe, you know, you're not completely wrong. He didn't admit directly to anything that, that I called him out on. Uh, no, he didn't, he didn't specifically say, but he didn't debate anything. Like, he put out a video responding to my, my video establishing what he had gotten wrong. He didn't really debate anything. Uh, he sort of dropped every other argument and said, well, but this will never be uphold in a, a higher court, uh, which is fair. And maybe it won't. But so far, as long as it is, uh, you know, police have qualified immunity to enforce this law, it is still technically considered illegal. Will you serve jail time for it if you're filming from public? Maybe, probably not so far. 
but that doesn't mean in the future that won't happen. Now, of course, and we've said this, um, it could go either way at the moment. He has his own interpretation as a, um, uh, well, he's a, he's a family lawyer, I think. So although he's been through uh, law school and he knows a lot of the terms, uh, I don't believe his expertise is in constitutional law. That doesn't mean he doesn't have training in it. It doesn't mean he's wrong. But as someone who is familiar with you know, how this is enforced by the military, um, he's putting out some stuff that is, has been shown to be blatantly false, especially when it comes to classifications. Sure, yeah, yeah. Correct. Well, the question becomes... That's a very good point. No, I. Merv, Merv gave a good point. Really, you got to have intent in anything. Well, that's that's one of the reasons, and we can discuss why this doesn't get enforced as much as it could. Uh, as far as constitutionality, there are Supreme Court cases um, where the Supreme Court said, "Look, the First Amendment is not without its restrictions. Uh, restrictions have to be made, or can be made, but only under very specific conditions. It has to right. be." The restriction has to be content neutral, has to be narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest. Uh, it has to be, uh, you know, a few other things. I don't have the top, off the top of my head. But there are restrictions. There is a system for how to approve a restriction to the First Amendment. And what it comes down to is, um, you know, is it reasonably or narrowly tailored? Is it uh, a reasonable this? Is it uh, content neutral that? Uh this restriction, it can be argued, and it can be argued against, and Merb has argued against it, but it can be argued that this restriction, uh, as applied in certain ways, for example, if someone is actually a threat to a base, uh, it can be argued that it does meet the requirements for that restriction. Now, it doesn't require intent, this statute. It does, generally for a conviction, it would have to um, show that I mean, intent is definitely going to be useful. Um, but <clears throat> if he, this guy doesn't intend to break the law, but he still films something that uh, is a significant concern if it's released and then releases it, um, you can still get charged. Because although they didn't intend to do it, the fact of the matter is that it still was a problem. So if without it actually being a security concern, yeah, this probably isn't going to be... Uh, it can be challenged as an as applied challenge of the statute meaning that the statute is not challenged as unconstitutional for the manner in which it is applied is now with freeman that is the challenge they made it said uh look there were no signs that would have let him know that uh he was filming a restricted area which isn't actually true uh there is a sign here now this is where he was i have a, a an x a red x right here um i have a thing pulled up if you manage to see it this is where freeman was arrested 
This is where he was standing and filming. He was filming this right here. This is a sign that says restricted area. This was not here when he was filming. It is now. Uh, and it's, it's in Spanish as well. Uh, this installation activity, etc., has been declared a restricted area by authority of the commander in accordance with the provisions uh, of, uh, what is it? The 1950 Internal Security Act, uh, which is 50 U.S.C. 797. Uh, it says all persons and vehicles entering herein are liable to search. Photographing or making notes, drawings, maps, or graphic representations of this area or its activities are prohibited unless specifically authorized by the commander. And it cites 18 U.S.C. 795. So now the defense that there wasn't a sign is no longer valid. And but it says entering the area. That's well, and any one person entering the area can be searched. Uh, it doesn't say that anyone entering the area cannot make photographs. That's, that's technically a separate thing. Um, but the argument... This is, this is from 2019, this photo was uh, from, I believe. I went back to 2016 and also 2008, and we see that right next to where he was, about you know 15 feet away, there's a warning that says restricted area, and it is blurred, uh, because around that time, these signs were still blurred on Google Maps. Now, not so much anymore, but that's how the government wanted it today. Any signs, just blur it. You can still kind of see restricted area, Right here. So, I mean, his defense wasn't great. And the prosecutors knew this. And they were kind of having none of it. And they went, no, 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 no. Like, he didn't have that defense. Uh, he should have known. And this went on for a little while. And Freeman went through a couple lawyers. He ended up paying $14,000. Uh, got rid of them both. Got a third lawyer. I don't know what he paid for that third lawyer. Spent a lot of money in travel uh, fees. And then, finally, after a year and a half... Uh, his third lawyer said, hey, hey, uh, government. Um, so we noticed that the arresting officer got removed for cause from his job. He was fired. And he was fired for... Uh, he, he was too aggressive in his law enforcement duties. And gosh, what a shame. It's too bad that his... Uh, you know, everything about this dude is now called into question about... Uh, who he is as a person, and how he enforced law. And pretty soon after that, the prosecutors filed to dismiss the charges without prejudice because they had just lost their key witness. Their key witness now had zero credibility, and it would have been a very weak case. And if they had tried to pursue this case, uh, they ran the very real risk of generating case law that they would not have wanted in regards to this, uh, this statute and the application of it. So they dismissed it without prejudice. Now, that doesn't, that's not an admission of Freeman's innocence. Uh, he did win in the sense that he no longer has to fight this. But he didn't win in the sense that he was acquitted and found innocent of the crime. He also spent, you know, at least, we know he spent, from his own admissions, at least $14,000 and a significant amount of his time uh, traveling to deal with this over a year and a half. So that's... Yeah, on, the, on the flip side of that is how much did the government spend of the taxpayers' money well, that's true. They waste on it, and to flip it over, even though he wasn't acquitted, he was the charge was dismissed. In other words, dismissing the charges means there were no charges to begin with. Well, that's not true. It just means that they're not willing to pursue the charges. Well, yeah, pursue it, which means, but when they dismiss it, it's just like when you when you cop a plea, you cop a plea to from a felony, whatever they charge you with, and it's down to misdemeanor. You you still cop the plea. You're guilty can't turn around and say, hey, hey they, they made me cop a plea because if I didn't, you know, they wouldn't put me in, they, they, they forced me to do this plea. So it's the flip side, it's the same thing with the government. When they, when they turn around and dismiss it, they can't turn around and say, well, yeah, we dismissed the charges, but he was guilty. Well, you can't do that. You lose that right to call somebody guilty. No, that's, that's fair. And we can't, yeah, we I'm can't say sides, he's, right. we can say he met the elements of the, of the statute, uh, and his arrest was valid. We can't say that he was guilty of violating the law um, necessarily because there is that question of constitutionality. And, and that's um, what I want to come back to. Mm -hmm. You were an MP. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean as far as, as police. When a police person um, detains you, arrests you, whatever sure. the case may be, he has to have probable cause. I mean, probable cause means you probably committed this crime. Right. Now, the problem we have here is even as an MP, or a, a police officer, you've got to understand that, okay, I don't know if this 18 U.S.C. 795 applies to the military because it's on their base. They're putting these signs up on their base. Mm -hmm. Or does it apply to the public because as a police officer, 
I'm I'm not trained on arresting people for filming a baby. So I... there's that fine line. So if, you know what it is is you gotta have. That's what I'm saying. The reason why people are not, you know, filming baby every single day, mm -hmm. not getting detained, they're not getting arrested, they're not getting charged because police and for the most part M no MPs know they're technically not breaking the law on 18 U.S.C. 795 because under that definition. Are they intentionally filming this baby with the intent to break 18 U.S.C. 795? So as a police officer, that's what it comes down to. Can you do it? And they can. And that's what I'm trying to basically say. Hmm. 1938 <coughs> came to the law. Sure. That's a long time. And we know people are filming the base all the time. And I, I can't pull it up now. I was trying to find it for you. I found the base in Google Maps. Sure. That, oh, my God. They film this base every which way but loose. That you've got pictures from the base, from the mountain, from the tree mm -hmm. line, from the street. I mean, you showing they're showing the buildings, the, the the walls, the gates. Not close up now, right? But it's all over the base. Sure. I don't know how Google got up in the mountains. I don't know who took these pictures. For the base. <laughs> the base is like, oh my god! If somebody wants to attack this base, you're showing them how to get to this base from the mountain. Yeah, no, it, it, that's true. But uh, oh, go ahead. You know. Nobody's getting arrested for this because just like in 3802, it, it's a fine line. Does a cop arrest you for failure to ID? Because on the 3802, they thought they could because it says failure to ID, you can be arrested for mm -hmm. it because of those B and C. B was if you give a false identity. C was if you're a witness. Well, right. people are saying all those are the same thing. So they were saying we're going to arrest you because B says you have to give your ID, you just can't give it a fault. So Turner versus Driver, it was very, I listened to the case, I don't know if you mm. did. Mm. The judge kept yelling at this prosecutor, because the prosecutor kept saying the crime was failure to ID. And the judge kept saying that's a secondary charge. What was the crime? And he kept saying this, and it was like, this prosecutor was playing dumb. And it was just frustrating the judges because they're like, 3802 is a not arrestable offense. You cannot mm. arrest somebody for failure to ID unless you arrested them. And that's where Turner got away with that a little bit. Sure. But they got qualified immunity because until the Fifth Circuit said you cannot arrest somebody for failure to ID unless there's a crime, they determined when they put Turner in the back of the police vehicle for I think like an hour, that was considered an arrest. So yes. They so they arrested him for failure to ID. The reason they but, had... Uh, uh, probable cause, or the uh, qualified immunity, sorry, is that they didn't think they had arrested him. They're like, no, he was just detained in the back of our patrol car in handcuffs. We never arrested him. Uh, well, that's for you. Right, and it, it took the case, because there was nothing that established exactly that that was an arrest, but the court's like, no, that's a long enough time. He he was arrested. Uh, so they had qualified immunity because they argued we didn't detain him, and they didn't have a reason to believe that they hadn't detained him until a court said, yeah, we're going to consider that, or I'm sorry, they had, they didn't think they had arrested him. And they had no reason yeah. to think that they hadn't arrested him until the court said, uh, "Hang on, guys, we're gonna we're gonna think that that's that counts as an arrest." That's where the qualified immunity comes from. And you're right that on 38.02 under Texas Penal Code, because Texas is not a stop and ID state, uh, subsection A is not an arrestable offense because it only applies after you've already been arrested. Subsection right, okay. B is an arrestable offense, but that only applies to states that don't have a statute. Uh, that requires you to uh, identify yourself when detained. So this well, is... Even in, even in other mm. states, though, they still have to have reasonable suspicion of a crime yes. in order to detain you for ID. So in Freeman's case, they had reasonable suspicion that he was violating 18 U.S.C. 795, right, which was good enough for detention. Exactly, right. Yes. And that, that's my whole point. That's exactly my point. You can detain that under 18 U.S.C. Mm -hmm. 795. Sure. The problem is you can't charge someone under it because it's suspicious activity. That's really what it is, not just 18 U.S.C. 795. It's suspicious activity. Mm. Somebody's filming a base. That's, well, I mean... It, even, the, even the guard says, hey, that guy's been sitting out there for two hours mm. filming everybody coming in and out. I mean, come on, what is this? So, yeah, you're going to go out and say, hey, guy, what are you doing? Been here for two hours. You know, if you're filming a story, that's fine, but, you know, if you're going to give me the finger or if you're going to give me the silent treatment, then we need to take this to the next level. But 18 U.S.C. 795, only based on the Freeman case, even though they pushed it, they really stopped it because they said, you know what, even though they lost their key witness, 
had film so hey we don't need a witness we got we got a film we got a live film on what happened yeah and but you'd still he still has the uh the right to face his accuser and so if they they'd have to bring this guy into court uh and then he'd be cross examined and then his every they it would give the defense just an incredible amount of leeway to just make the government look bad through this dude. And you, you got a, a total point there. That's, see, that, that's what drives the mm -hmm. situation because this kid gets dismissed. We're not going to know what exactly what the outcome would have been because you're right. They lost their witness. Was that mm -hmm. the reason? Or, you know, did the higher ups come back and say, hey, we're not willing to use 18 USC 795 on a mm -hmm. small fry like this? We're not going to do it. Sure. Drop the case, move on. You know, let this guy get out of here, and we'll we'll look for bigger ones. You know, mm -hmm. group of people want to come and film. Maybe we can get a bigger fry out. Of here. But my thing is, since 1938, just can't all these people filming bases, and we're still not finding any you know arrest, convictions, anything related related to this. Sure. If this, if this was such a serious issue, which it is, when this came out in 1938, it was serious. When they mm, yeah. That, it wasn't a <coughs> so wrong. It was serious. But we're not arresting people because I think the big thing is they realize, well, if they're in public, they have a constitutional right and the constitution, we can't we can't make a statute that over over well over, well, over the So I see what you're saying. I mean they have the, the probable cause, the reasonable suspicion uh, well, they have probable cause because he meets the elements of the statute. Now, mm -hmm. the question of whether or not the statute is reasonable, that's that's really the debate. That's the entire debate is if it's reasonable enough to uh, warrant the exception that it creates to the First Amendment protections. Um, now, you were saying that a lot of police officers don't enforce this, uh, and that's absolutely true. So this is a federal law. Military police tend to be more familiar, or DOD police, uh, people who enforce law on federal property uh, of military installations tend to be familiar. Civilian police often have no idea about this law because they don't, they're not around those bases that often or they're not enforcing law. Um, and there's, even if they do, they have no obligation to actually enforce federal law. Uh, state or civilian or, well, state or municipal police or sheriff's departments don't have to enforce federal law if they don't want to. That's why you see things like um, Washington State. Uh, you know, marijuana is is legal. Well, it's not. It's still illegal federally. It's just that the state removed all of its or most of its um, its state laws and said we're not going to enforce the federal laws. So take a hike, federal government. We're going to let people smoke here. It's still illegal to smoke marijuana in Washington State or in um, Colorado or in um, what is it? Vermont, I think, did that relatively recently, or in all these other places. It's still technically illegal. It's just the state's like, we're not going to prosecute it, so don't worry about it, folks, unless, you know, you're selling it or, or doing all sorts of things. So there are times, and I know there are departments out there that are like, we're not going to enforce this law. We think it's stupid. Um, but sometimes it's that the police just don't know. And other times, I mean, this, this law is intended, again, to prohibit uh, espionage. It is a misdemeanor. It is not worth, in many cases, the amount of time to deal with the challenges. Because I mean, you can easily just be like, no, I'm challenging this on constitutional grounds. And you can, I mean, this case can go on forever. Uh, and SAUSA, these, uh, the, basically the attorneys that work for the military installation to deal with the civilian cases, they're overworked. They are over, I've never been to an installation where they had enough SAUSA uh, lawyers, ever. So they're going to look at this and go, it's just a guy filming. Meanwhile, we have some civilian punching a soldier in the face uh, at the, the DFAC, you know, on, on base. Some civilian visitor got drunk and started, you know, assaulting people. We're going to focus on that case instead. I've had many of my cases uh, when I was, I was military police just thrown out because it wasn't worth their time. We had probable cause. We knew the person. We had witness statements. We had everything. And instead of admitting, like, yeah, I'm wrong, the person was like, nope, I'm going to fight it. And Salsa went... Yeah, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna take them up on that offer because it's not worth our time. That is a big problem. So uh, for those of you who ever get charged on a military installation, fight it because there's a good chance it's just gonna get dropped because it's not worth it. Uh, don't tell them I told you that though. Uh, but that is a very real problem. So 
the base won't go after this unless they think it's going to be very easily won, which they thought with Freeman until they lost their key witness, or they think this is definitely, you know, super, super hardcore espionage. So we have things like um, Zhao Qian Li, which uh, Merb actually, he gave me, he was real mad at me because it's a, it's a Chinese name, and uh, he didn't like that he had to find it. Uh, let me show you Zhao Qian Li. It's not a great argument on my point, but it does... Uh, it was useful to prove Merb wrong about the application of 18 U.S.C. 795 because he was arguing that it can't be applied at all, which is not the case. Now, Xiao Qianli was a Chinese citizen in the United States, uh, and he was arrested. He actually entered the base fully. So the argument here isn't that he was filming from outside, but it is an application of 18 U.S.C. He was convicted. He was charged with six different counts of, um, of filming, uh, a mil restricted military installation. He was convicted of one because he took a plea deal. Now, Merb seems to think that he was going to be charged under uh, 18 U.S.C. 794, which during a time of war can get you 10 years to life in prison. Uh, and Merb thinks that he took the plea deal because he was going to be charged with 18 U.S.C. 794 instead of 18 U.S.C. 795. There's nothing to indicate that that was actually going to happen. In fact... In the arrest report or the investigative report from the FBI officer, I believe, who originally detained him, uh, yeah, Charles Barrett, special agent FBI, says that, uh, you know, this dude, you know, he's a special agent with the FBI, and that he saw this guy filming, and he said, hey, he's violating 18 U.S.C. 795, and therefore we believe he's violating 18 U.S.C. 795. 794 never came into it. And that's that's from a different argument. That's not super relevant to our discussion. But just the fact that Merb thought, and for those of you who are like, oh, Merb must be right because he's a lawyer, he knows a lot of stuff. He gets a lot of stuff wrong in, in our discussions, though. And I'm sure I get a lot of stuff wrong uh, that he knows more about than I do. But the idea that he only took the plea deal because he's going to get charged with 794, there's nothing... To establish that he was charged with multiple counts of 795 and he pled guilty to one of them and he's facing a year in prison yes go ahead let me jump in here yeah yes I know what you're talking about that case but that was actually actually i want to bring up uh, real quick on that one that was that was a good case because that hmm. shows you where 18 usc 795 applied to somebody on the base absolutely died, went on the base film did all these bad things not supposed to do, and he got charged with 18 U.S.C. 705, got convicted. That's a, that's a good case to show, yes, that's why we got 18 U.S.C. 795. Exactly. They're fools enough to come on this base, take pictures, do things you're not supposed to do. We got a statute against that. Mm -hmm. if, if you kept your butt out in the beach, in the water, that was probably all base property, and took your mm -hmm. pictures from out there, we probably wouldn't have bothered you because it was probably, you weren't going to see anything from the beach anyway. Sure. Yeah. No. And to show that the flip <coughs> line, I do need to say one thing before I go because I gotta do dinner. I gotta bite. No, that's that's fine. That's fine. I've uh, actually I've enjoyed this uh, discussion quite a bit. Yeah, it's actually pretty good. I'm glad we were able to actually sure. talk civilly rather than this whole back and forth with. Yeah, I, getting confused with I do worry so sometimes. Like. Yeah. <laughs> come across poorly over the. I don't. I don't mean any disrespect over my my comments, no, but no, I you know. Like, <coughs> I, that's not what I'm saying. Or sure. But I wanted to end this because the one thing we did want to bring up was the thing about can an MP arrest a civilian mm. off base? Ah, yes. Um, for a crime that not on base. So in other words, if a, if the MP, if, let's say 18 U.S.C. 795, if an MP sees somebody off the base, mm -hmm. you know, across the street or whatever, can he get off the base, walk over to him, and arrest him under 18 U.S.C. 795? Or can an MP, um, I don't know, let's put it this way, can an MP arrest, let's, let's just say in a scenario is, sure. he's got a friend, somebody's sleeping with his wife, he's mad, so the MP says, well, don't worry, I'm going to go, I'm going to go mess with this guy, I'm going to find something to mm. charge him and arrest him, and I'm going to go off base, I'm going to arrest this guy, and take him over to the police station, and turn him over, whatever the case is. Well, yeah, I can I can answer that. So I've, as an investigator, I've operated off base, uh, not in a law enforcement capacity. I did investigative work, but I didn't have the authority to detain anyone or arrest anyone or anything like that. Now, soldiers have, as as they can do citizens arrests, 
However, there's this thing called the Posse Comitatus uh, Act, which generally forbids, with few exceptions, the use of active duty soldiers to enforce law outside of a military installation. Now, that means, and again, uh, DOD property. The MPs can enforce law on DOD property. Uh, it's that property does not necessarily and often does not end at the fence line. So there are times, like th there was a highway that ran by my, my most recent base I worked at that I could absolutely pull people over on, even though it's people thought it was outside of the base. But So we have a territorial jurisdiction that we are limited to. It was on. It was on. It was. It was basically a um, an easement, a public easement that the public was allowed to use as a highway, but it went through DOD property. It. Uh, it, we, so it, that had its own implication. It was really nice because that gave us the ability to chase people down if they fled from the base uh, to a degree. I think that's part of the reason why the base was allowed to maintain their um, their ownership of that land. But so we, the MPs have territorial jurisdiction, but so does civilian police. They also have territorial territorial jurisdiction. Some police have uh, subject matter jurisdiction. For example, ones that are specific to certain types of crimes. Um, but the thing that civilian police can get that military police cannot get is they can be granted concurrent jurisdiction, meaning they they can enforce law in uh, two different territorial jurisdictions that overlap, or they can get uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction. So if they're, for example, pursuing someone into a different county. Uh, under the conditions of that pursuit, they might be allowed to continue to enforce the law. But as law enforcement, I am incredibly limited because of the Posse Comitatus Act. I can maybe still conduct a citizen's arrest, but I have to be so incredibly careful about it uh, that I, I, I really I wouldn't risk it. If I was in my law enforcement uniform, if I had my police vest on, my duty belt, I would not I would follow them. But I would not give any orders because they would assume that I was still acting in a law enforcement capacity and I can get three years in prison uh, for doing that. So there are extreme limits that civilians would not have. However, as law enforcement goes, uh, we have essentially the same authority within our territorial jurisdictions. It's just that there are federal laws that prohibit me from going, from doing anything crazy outside of my... Exactly. Whereas... That, does the same hold true for uh, the civilian police as far as chase, not chasing somebody? Yeah, yeah, that's chasing somebody on a base or going up to the base. Hey, we're going to go in here and arrest somebody. That's a good question. I, so, isn't that illegal? I, I don't think civilian police can have any jurisdiction on a military base. Ah, see, that's that's where the concurrent jurisdiction comes in because civilian police can get that concurrent jurisdiction, meaning we let. Uh, civilian police on our base to do whatever they had. I mean, they called ahead usually, but if they were had their lights and sirens on, they went onto the base. We would let them. At least someone would follow them just see what's up. Um, but they'd call ahead. They'd radio our dispatch to say we're entering your base at this location at this time. We're pursuing someone, um, and they would have they would have that concurrent jurisdiction. They had there was an agreement that had been made with our base and the the county saying if you have a reason to enter this base uh, for law enforcement purposes. Uh, Yes, you know, by all means, we don't have the the opposite. The opposite's not true, except now, for DOD if, police. If, if if they're military, though, sure, doesn't that exclude them? Because I thought I read somewhere that said no, you have to get they have to get approval from the base commander in order yes. to arrest a military a, a, a soldier, basically. And yeah, generally, like to or to get that concurrent the jurisdiction. They have to call the base and say, hey, we got this soldier out here. He's drunk, rude, he's rowdy. And they would send the MPs over there to arrest them. Normally, they say, "Let's." Oh, that's. I mean, that's a good point. Um, so, with the concurrent jurisdiction, I do want to point out that uh, bases often have DOD police, which are civilian police that work for the Department of Defense, and they can have concurrent jurisdiction. But if you're a soldier in law enforcement, not so much. Now, when it comes to a soldier off base being arrested by right. the civilian police, they are not required, to my knowledge, to contact the base. Uh, they can hold that. I mean, they're going to because it's less work for them. So what they'll almost always do, and it's exactly what I would have done in the same situation, is if they get a soldier, they'll contact, they'll just hold them, contact the base and say, hey, we've got a guy, unless it's a super serious crime. They'll say, we've got this guy, he was I don't know, DUI, come pick him up. And we'll come pick him up. And that means that we have to do all the paperwork, which frees them up to do whatever they're doing, which is probably, there's usually a lot more crime off of a military installation than there is on a military installation. Simply the fact that soldiers are, are watched so closely, you know, drug tested. They have people always in charge of them. They're restricted in many ways. Uh, there's still a lot of crime on a military installation, 
But compared to off the installation, at least wherever I was, uh, you know, crime was always higher. So we were more than happy to take some stuff off their hands uh, if we didn't have anything going on. So no, they although they probably will contact us, they don't have to contact us. Although it's generally in the... Uh, I might be wrong about that. I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Although it is in the soldier's best interest when they do get a phone call um, to call the base and be like, hey, can someone help a brother out? So, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. In their best interest. Now, one thing. Were you, were you in Texas? Were you ever stationed in Texas? I was never stationed in Texas, but I know people who were. Uh, I've, I mean, I've served with I mean, a lot of people. There are some big bases in Texas. Uh, so I'm familiar with, with certain things about Texas. I've done some research into Texas myself because it comes up every once in a while in uh, conversations. Right. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to end this with... Uh, sure. You know, it's very uh, civil, at least. Uh, I appreciate so, that. Merv doesn't believe in civil. <laughs> he... Oh, man, Merv... I don't know if you've ever seen any of his uh, Discord. Where, oh, I have... I've, I, I specifically, I was told, like, hey, join his Discord. You'd have a lot of fun in there. And then Merb turned on me, and I went, oh, this is what he does. I have no interest in that. Which is one of the reasons I, I haven't wanted to. I, I just, yeah. I, the blind justice one really gets because Yeah, I have, I, I, I'm, he puts out, there's good information he puts out. It's just the way he puts it out. I have no reason to really be interested in interacting with him. And with us, I mean, you're right. No one's been convicted. Now, my argument is that doesn't mean it can't happen. Doesn't mean it won't. And yeah. if it, if this law ever gets dropped, if it ever becomes clear that uh, through case law that it doesn't apply to someone filming on public property, I owe Merb a can of bacon. I will send him a can of bacon uh, okay, because I've, I've, <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't, I don't want you guys to think that I think that this law is infallible. Just that at the moment it is still applicable. Now in the future, I fully expect it to go away. It hasn't yet. So. Use caution when when testing it. If you guys are, are auditing, um, and that's something I don't get across. I think nearly as much as I should. So I definitely appreciated uh, having this conversation with you and being able to put out all this information in real time. Yeah, uh, better in real time rather than it. It certainly is. It really is. I I hate how I come across in the comments where I'm like, no, what are you talking about? Um, but yeah, are there any other questions before uh, you head out to dinner? Nope, I'm going to wish you the best, and we'll have another conversation, I'm sure, again. And... Fantastic. Looking forward to it. All right, you take care of yourself. All right, you too. Shkablamo. All right, folks, and that was our conversation. I'll still talk to you guys, though, um, because I'm sure you guys have some questions. There was a lot of information being put out. Uh, open bases. Oh, see... Enforcement of 18 U.S.C. 795 comes down to what the commander wants. The commander has full authority to say, I want this to be prohibited from filming, or I want this to uh, be open to filming. If it's an open base, they're probably not going to restrict you from filming. But I always recommend you call the base. If you call their, um, their public affairs office, every base has one, I believe I, i've never seen a base that didn't call their public affairs office they will get you they'll have the most up-to-date information on this so uh yeah I mean, feel free to keep sending me comments uh even after this stream is done uh, i have a lot of fun doing that i should do that more often uh i'm sure i got a few things wrong uh regarding my you know real-time information off the top of my head i tried to make sure you guys had uh the documents that I was citing from so so that um, you knew I wasn't just making up my quotes. Uh, as far as the the stuff that would happen in court, the arguments that could be made about you know how the First Amendment works, uh, Merb is probably right that, you know, I made some semantics errors and there were a few things I got wrong. And so you should definitely do the research on your own instead of trusting what I've said about that. Uh, however, if you read the cases against some of these people, which have never resulted in a, an acquittal or conviction, but certainly do seem to indicate the government is still, still willing to at least try to pursue this. Uh, it's pretty clear that the argument can certainly be made that this statute is not an unconstitutional statute uh, based on the Supreme Court's allowance of certain types of restrictions. So, oh, Hall Monitor, send me that video. Law is there to be tested, absolutely. And I don't want to make the argument that it's law, therefore it's right. 
My argument is that it's law, therefore it can be enforced. Now, if you don't like the law, you absolutely have the right, and the beautiful thing about this country is you have the right to petition the government for a redress of grievance and say, I don't like this law. We have a bunch of people here that don't like this law. Please change it. Amazing, right? And so if, if we think as, if enough of us within the United States think this should not be a law, put together a petition, get it changed, and if it goes away, it goes away, and I have no issue with that. However, I understand why it still exists. Uh, d <laughs> King Nine saying he likes my shirt. I like this shirt too. I am. It's just so absurd. It's so absurd. Uh, J B P H H. Which which one is uh, G? I know J B M H H. J B. Oh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Harbor Hickam. Yes, 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 yes. I was thinking Joint Base uh, Meyer Henderson Hall. Um, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam is weird because it has some Navy stuff with it, and I don't really know how the Navy works with their, with how they interpret 18 U.S.C. 795 because it is important which group is interpreting it because it comes down to essentially what the secretaries of the armed forces want as far as the interpretation of this statute. Um, so I know what like, the Army definitions are for I don't know what the Navy definitions are uh, very well Vandenberg, uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base now Nancy Nathaniel was saying that uh, people have asked him why he has never audited Vandenberg Air Force Base because he lived near it uh, he never technically did because the highway that runs through it is technically DOD property That fair point I would not recommend testing that I wouldn't um, I mean if you want to you can but if you look at auditors that have been arrested, um, Johnny Fibo has been arrested for filming a restricted military installation. Um, James Freeman has been arrested. Uh, accountability for all has been detained. Uh, and almost every single one of them, they're like, oh, I'm going to file a lawsuit about you know against these people because how dare they violate my constitutional rights? And then you kind of wonder why they never file lawsuits, right? Why, why would they why would they not file a lawsuit? They're so gung-ho about it. One can only imagine they went to a lawyer and said, hey, can I file a lawsuit? And they went, it's your funeral, bud. Good luck. Um, corrections, all right. Hardesty was a corrections officer in Ohio. Uh, yeah, no, I was, I'm, I'm more, um, I mean, I did it in, in, on a German base, and I've done it on the, uh, the West Coast. Never, never, well, I did a little bit in uh, Missouri, but nothing, uh, kind of, yeah, overall, um, Johnny Five, I mean Johnny Five O was arrested uh, about that. He he decided to fight it, and they were like, "Yeah, we're not willing to fight it," which comes back again to Sousa being overworked. Um, if you guys are familiar with the auditor, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, Stray Dog, the what is it? Stray Dog, the something. Let me let me do a little googling. Stray Dog, the Exposer. That's it. Uh, Stray Dog the Exposer has been arrested for it, my understanding. I know a guy who works in um, the area that he was arrested in and is trying to keep me up to date. He can't tell me too much because a lot of it is still for fish use only, but apparently uh, there might be some good case law. And again, if it's case law that disputes what I'm saying about the legality, great, right? Now, I'm not disputing that you will or will not get a conviction. I just want case law. I'm just saying that you can be arrested for it. might not get charged. But you can't be arrested for it. Uh, yeah, and Selma is on probation. He still does it. That's what, like... Oh, it's it's it's, it's so frustrating. Like, you're on probation. You, you know that there are issues with what you're doing. Why are you still doing it? Why are you still testing this, right? And what it comes down to is this mentality. They're like, oh, well... Psh, the police are wrong. Therefore, I'm not wrong. And I can keep doing this. Well, how's that working for you? Not well, right? But at the same time... He's already got so many... His criminal record is extensive enough that it doesn't matter. What's another charge, right? And he has enough of a... Um, of a following that they'll they'll help him pay bail. So it's... Yeah, no, I, I would agree that in some ways hurting the cause. And again, guys, I support the, the First Amendment auditor movement. When done correctly. I think Anselmo doesn't really... He, he resists learning. I've... I've talked to him, uh, you know, through comments, and he's been very resistant to the information I've I've given to him. Uh, oh my God, I 
honestly, if it wasn't illegal for me to record the conversation, I should I should call his phone. He has his we have his personal phone number or the the, the dispatch number. Um, I I might I might be tempted one of these days to call him on stream, but I have to make it clear that I'm recording, uh, and he's probably just gonna hang up. Hmm. Hmm. Mm-mm. I'm. Th- I'll think about it. I'll think about the legality of it. Um. But think, uh, Eric Brandt. He just got in trouble. Uh. Or he did, he's got in trouble a lot. He just got convicted on one of his charges. Now Eric Brandt is someone who calls for the murder of police officers and public officials. He thinks that they're wrong, and that they need to be killed to keep the other public officials in line. He. He is wrong. On many many of his things. Now he's he's created some really great case law that helps him. He's done a great thing for the community. But in this competitive world of, of auditing on YouTube where you're not gonna get views usually, uh, it's hard to get views unless you're very antagonistic towards the police. Um, he has become very antagonistic towards the police. And when you know the government was resistant to that behavior, uh, well it must be the government that was wrong, not him. And that's the problem. And he is facing the consequences of his mistakes. And I hope he learns from it. And I don't hold it against him. He's not the kind of person I would, you know, spend my free, like, ask to spend free time with. But I'm not saying he's a bad person. Just not someone I feel the need to directly interact with on a regular basis. Um, But there are times where people are like, no. You know, I can do this because I can do it. And look, look at the complicated, you know, things surrounding it. Uh, and a lot of these auditors are not, and they're getting to the point where they're getting away with stuff, and they're they're continuing to push it, and they're pushing it too far, and it's it's hurting them, and it's hurting the movement. And I think that's a problem. And I think it's a problem how blindly some of the followers follow them. James Freeman's followers. Uh, he has some followers that are, are they'll do anything that he or they'll believe anything he says and I probably have some followers that are the same way I don't want that I want you guys to fact check me I want you to tell me when you think I'm wrong and I want to have these discussions um, but on on both sides of the argument there are people who are too pro-police and there are people who are too anti-police and you have to be receptive to information you have to be willing to learn more about it I, you know, Hall Monitor, I've thought about that, um, doing, uh, testing my ability to be an asshole towards the police, and I've decided I'm not going to do it. Um, just out of respect to the police, having been police, um, it's, it's, I'm just, I'm just not interested in, in ruining it. It's a difficult job. You don't know how difficult a job it is until you've done it. Or you've you've been along for the ride, and I don't want to add to it. I I don't want to be responsible. And although I'm I'm I can I could do it, I'm going to decide not to. Unfortunately, um, and I understand why it would be interesting for me with my experience to do it. I'm just that's not something that I feel like I should do uh, morally. It's just it's a moral thing. Um, yeah, uh, Nancy Nathaniel says, what's interesting, interesting about Eric Brandt is when I met him and actually went out filming with him, he was a completely different person with me than what I've seen in his videos. I think, yeah, I think a lot of it is an act for views. I think Eric Brandt isn't as ridiculous as he wants people to think. Um, I'm assuming you mean that he was a little calmer. And at the same time, people act differently with different people. There are people I hang around with where I swear like a sailor, uh, I, I'm just, you know... I say things that might not be appropriate in public. And it's just who the person is. You know, like a soldier I served with. We're probably going to talk to each other in a private setting a little more inappropriately than I would in a public setting with you guys. You know that I um, make a conscious effort not to swear to you guys. Um, I try to be friendly and polite. But there are people I'm with where I'm, I'm still going to be a nice person. But I'm going to be a little more a little more aggressive, a little more, you know, of a party animal. Depending on the situation, who I'm with, and where I'm at. Um, and I assume... Eric Brandt is not immune to that same sort of thing. And there was a video I saw with um, Furry Potato, and I've enjoyed Furry Potato's videos. Because Furry, Furry Potato doesn't push the envelope too much and has uh, shown some really interesting things where she absolutely, her rights were violated. 
Uh, but there was a video where she did a cop block with um, SGV News First. And SGV News First is incredibly antagonistic. And Furry Potato started being the same way. And I was kind of disappointed because I, I appreciated Furry Potato for the fact that she wasn't antagonistic to the level that SGV was. And so I think it is very dependent. And Nasty Nathaniel is not, is not an antagonistic person in the videos that I've seen. Uh, so I assume that the fact that he was with you, he decided, yeah, let's, let's keep this calm. But it really depends on who you're doing it with. And I think that if I went out and did an audit with an auditor, I would probably say things I would regret later based on just the, the atmosphere and the emotional you know route that we were going with it. If they started getting intense with an officer and the officer said, hey, you can't do that, I'd probably step in and go, no, they can't. Now, would I agree with the initial activity from the auditor? Probably not, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to tell an officer to you know back down. <laughs> not a great idea, but... Yeah, Furry's... Oh, man, Furry getting shot. I... Oh, boy. I'm amazed that a security officer didn't uh, didn't get charged, because that looked like a negligent discharge to me. I don't disagree that the gun was out, but everything about it seemed to indicate that the guy accidentally fired off the gun, because this is in California. Uh, security officers in California do not have the authority to fire warning shots. So he fired it, and his demeanor instantly changed to be very jumpy, as if, oh no, I've messed up, like, let me uh, uh, think of a reason why I did that. And then he said, this is a warning shot. No, it was not. You don't get warning shots. But he was still found innocent of, I don't know what. Uh, and I think that a civil suit, I don't know if there was a civil suit. If there wasn't, there should be. Um, for he should not have been shot. Would I have engaged in the activity for he was engaging in? No. Uh, an audit packing. What do you mean, um, an audit packing? And you're right, there is a difference between a public servant and a public slave. Um, just because you pay taxes doesn't mean they have to follow your orders. And a lot of, a lot of people think, oh, I pay taxes so I can tell you what to do. It's like, no, you... You pay taxes to the government, and you have the right to, you know, elect people into government or run for office. Uh, but the government takes that money and disseminates it, and they make the decisions. Uh, oh, packing like carrying a weapon. I would not. Uh, I could. Um, hmm. Ooh, I would. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, legally. Could you? Uh, why do they like the 17s and 19s? Uh, the Glocks. I honestly, I'm not a Glock person. I'm more of a Sig guy. Uh, I like the Sig Sowers. Uh, I carried a, a P228 for a long time, and I, I really liked it. It's, a, it's an older one. Um, they're expensive. And I've been looking at the P320, which is the new one that the Army's getting. And I hear pretty good things about it. But people people like Glock. It's a solid weapon. It's I mean, it's really good for the price. Um... And then it depends on, you know, do you want to shoot 9mm out of it? Do you want 45? 45? I don't know. I'm not, I don't really know too much about Glocks. I've carried a Glock. I don't know too much about them. Um, get rid of this. Uh, but the double action, I, it comes down to legality, I think. Um, like 10 pound triggers in California, that sort of thing. Uh, I hate the 10 pound trigger. But, uh, uh, Whatever the law is, cool. Uh, 1911 cocked and loaded, or M9A1. Uh, is the M9? That's just the Beretta, right? The M9A1. Hold on, we're gonna we're gonna check this because I feel stupid for not confirming this. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys a thing about the uh, M9A1, which is the Beretta. Uh, in fact, I'm going to pull a picture here of it for you. This gun is garbage. It's okay. It shoots. It does a fine job. It's heavy. It's bulky. Uh, the 9 mil. I mean, I enjoy 9 mil. I think I prefer 9 mil over the, the 45 that a uh, 1911 uh, shoots. But look at that classic design. That's just... I think it's a little... Well, I do like the, the Breda. The Breda has a nice look. It has a nice look. But it's big. It's bulky. I would... For my own personal use, I'd choose the 1911. Um... For law enforcement, I'd probably choose the Beretta just because it holds more rounds. I don't... I, I wouldn't own one myself. 
I used to have one of these bad boys, and it was great. Uh, I'm looking at getting, maybe, one of these days, one of these guys. Um, but I'm not, I'm not much of a gun person. Uh, I appreciate them for, you know, what they do as tools. I don't collect them or anything. I collect other weird things. I have a, a collection of World War II bayonets that some people might think is absurd. But, um... Uh, Smith & Wesson does, yeah. Smith & Wesson makes some quality stuff. I'm looking at their um, the Smith & Wesson uh, Governor, simply because I can shoot less than lethal four, uh, ten shotgun rounds out of it. Uh, so I, I, yeah. All right, so, oh, I'm um, sorry. Nasty Nathaniel, which Scientology audits have you watched? Oh, boy. Uh, which ones have I watched? I've, wa I've, I've seen at least probably five of them. Uh, I don't know exactly um, which ones they were. I don't know too much about the Church of Scientology. I know enough to know that I don't really care for them. Um, and, of course, there's the uh, the South Park episode. Uh, but I, 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 I wouldn't consider myself an expert on Scientology by any means. I just... Scientology is, is fairly secretive. Uh, and they get a lot of flack from people. And so I understand why they'd be concerned about people filming. So it's a good thing to audit because you're likely to get a reaction. And um, I actually did my audit. I, I finally did my audit, guys. Uh, I had to release my video because um, I've been doing these live streams instead of doing videos recently just because of a time issue. Uh, why I discussed how I was going to do my audit. And now I've actually done it. So it's going to be weird because I'm going to release the video on how I'm going to do it, which I did film before I did the audit. Uh, I'm going to release it after I've done the audit, knowing what happened. And then I'm going to live stream my video on the audit and discuss it with you guys because it went... Uh, it was pretty interesting. I didn't get much of a police reaction, but may have saved a dude's life. I'm going to leave it at that. can keep you guys interested. So if you want to get an alert when that goes out, you know, hit that subscribe button. Or, you know, just check on me later. I'm not desperate for subscribers. I'm not doing this for money. Maybe in the future I'll monetize. Uh, I will tell you guys I'm not capable of monetizing at this time based on my, uh, my subscriber level. Uh, I don't know if I will subscribe once I hit the amount required, uh, just in the interest of being completely transparent with you guys. Uh, but if I do monetize this, I will be donating uh, money to various charities from it, because it just it feels wrong to be benefiting from like too much from discussing things I think the public should be aware of. So I, I if you guys have any charities you think would be good for this money, I'm thinking domestic violence charities, because uh, that's something I dealt with a lot, was was investigating domestic violence. Um, and then civil rights charities, uh, donating money to the uh, Civil Liberties Union. I think that would be a good start. But, yeah, as far as, as far as auditing, things are happening within the community. If you want to see you know, how bad things are going on, I know um, Desert Sentinel is Dead was in my chat earlier. And Desert Sentinel is Dead puts out... Uh, a lot of information about the current arrests and court cases about the auditing movement. Uh, oh, the uh, the cop watch I did, the accidental cop watch. Well, no, it was intentional cop watch, the accidental audit. Uh, I had a lot of fun with that. I, I'm tempted to do it again because I really enjoyed listening to the police scanner and like trying to hunt down the crime. Uh, it really brought me back to when I used to be able to enforce crime. But I found the incident. I arrived a little late to really see anything because there was a lot of area I was covering. And it's difficult to actually find it uh, sometimes. Because you got to get there before it's over, and you got to know where it is. And the I was in Seattle. The Seattle police, they use the computers, so like stuff will get called out, but it also gets shown on their computers, so no one's asking for clarification. And it's very frustrating because I have to hear it the first correctly the first time, or else I don't get to go to it. And I have no idea where it is. Uh, so I did go there. If you guys haven't seen that, uh, it's not great. It's not a great video. Um, so I'm filming. I walked through a public easement, it, publicly accessible property, but it was private property. And the security guard, who I thought was a police officer, was like, hey, you can't be there. Oh, okay, cool. So I walked across the street to see what was going on. Uh, police were there. They left. I waved to one of them. He waved back. There were no issues. Uh, and then as I'm about to leave, because I'm like, oh, police are gone why stay here the security guy goes you better delete that footage or we're gonna have problems and i was not expecting that i had not prepared mentally for it so i was like oh uh, uh 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 why and you know we had a discussion i basically told him that he was wrong 
Uh, he, he wasn't happy. He threatened to sue me uh, if he saw any of the video. But that's a court case I would win. I just don't want to go through the hassle of it. So I didn't push it too far. But uh, it wasn't great. It wasn't. I was kind of like, this is awful. Do I really want to publish it? I didn't call him a tyrant. Because he is he's only a uh, police... Or, sorry, a security officer. He's not police. So technically... Um, he's not a public servant. So I didn't... Didn't play that card. Where I said, I have the right to film me because you're a public servant. He actually even clarified it. He's like, I'm not a police officer. I'm like, oh, you aren't? Whoops. You just... Your uniform looks real, real close. Which isn't uncommon. Um, but it was raining. I couldn't see that well. Um, I didn't get too close. Oh, boy. Uh, so... I told him, like, look, I have the right to, uh, under the freedom of press, uh, but you're arguing that I don't have the right be- under the uh, right to petition the government for redress of grievances. But since I can, I have the right based on one or both of those things, uh, even though I don't have the right under the right to petition the government, I still have the freedom of the press. So I'm so sorry, but this is going to happen. <coughs> um, how would I handle it if a cop told me that? I'd keep filming. I'd be like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way, sir. If you think that you need me to back up, because uh, my presence at this location is obstructing your investigation, I would be more than happy to retreat to a, a specific distance. But uh, according to your your manual, let me pull it up because I have this saved um, somewhere. I, I went through the Seattle Police uh, Handbook because I, I go way too in-depth about this sort of thing. You'll see it in the video that I put out. Uh, the upcoming video. I have so many videos that I'm, I'm trying to put out right now. Um, but where is it? This is an entire like, how many pages? Seven pages I have here, of uh, stuff that I I learned specifically in case I had to interact with a police officer. Um, all right. According to the Seattle Police Manual, when reasonable, as early in the contact as safety permits, the officer making contact with the subject will inform the suspect of the following. Now, this I, I included specifically specifically, because not every department is required to give to identify themselves as law enforcement. Well, I mean, as law enforcement, yes, but as a um, to give their rank and name. There are some departments, like some federal agencies, that don't have that requirement. So I included this specifically because they are instructed in their police manual to give their names, their ranks and title, the fact that they are a Seattle police officer, but I mean, that's the same for any police department. They're generally supposed to tell you uh, the reason for the stop and that the stop is being recorded. Now this is as early in the contact as safety permits. So there are times where they don't have to tell you because it would be unsafe for them to do so. So if they're doing a no knock warrant, they're not going to tell you until later, Uh, but um, it gets better because Seattle Municipal Code, which is also in their handbooks where I got it, says that a person not involved in an incident may remain in the vicinity of any stop, detention, or arrest occurring in a public place and observe or record activity and express themselves, including making comments critical of an officer's actions. (laughs) Ha ha. That's a big deal right there that it says that. As long as the person's conduct and presence are otherwise lawful, the person's conduct and presence must not... Oh, excuse me. I adjust my legs because going a little numb here. Uh, the person's conduct and presence must not hinder, delay, or compromise legitimate police actions or rescue attempts, or sorry, rescue efforts, threaten the safety of the officers or members of the public, or attempt to incite others to violence. Uh, these conditions, this one's really important. Uh, these conditions on the conduct do not prohibit conduct that creates a slight inconvenience for an officer, such as a minor delay caused by escorting the person to a nearby location. Now, this is a big deal because there's a statute that makes my recording basically they can't stop me from being in the area now if i'm hindering their investigation if i could be if they can articulate that i'm a safety risk if i'm you know within 21 feet is generally what is considered uh, a safety risk although depends on the situation they can ask me to step back now i can't be charged with obstruction just because they had to escort me back that's a big deal as well so saying i can i can be in the area i can uh observe and record that activity I can insult them all I want. I can't incite violence. Uh, I can't threaten them. I can't uh, hinder or delay or compromise their legitimate police activities. But if I'm just hanging out in the area and they say, you need to step back, sir, I'd be like, all right, cool. What would be a safe distance for me to step back? And they said a thousand feet. That's not reasonable. That's that's a little unreasonable. So I would probably be like, 
uh, I'm, I'm stepping back to 20 feet. Would you like me to keep going? I'm stepping back to 50 feet. Would you like me to keep going? Right? And then I would file a complaint. You bet your butt I'd file a complaint. Be like, a thousand feet. A th I'm allowed to stay in the area. Is a thousand feet. Is one kilometer away within the vicinity of the stop, detention, or arrest? Now, I'm not going to fight them on the street. That would be ridiculous because I don't want to um, subject myself to legal repercussions or... Even if there weren't legal repercussions, there could be physical injury caused by them detaining me. I'm not going to resist physically. But I don't want to fight this more than I'm willing to accept the consequences that might, you know, reasonable or not, that might occur from it. So I would, I would clarify. I would follow instructions. Might do it slowly, but I would follow instructions. I would clarify exactly what they want. And I'd be like, hey, but your handbook says I can do this. And they said, nope, I don't care what the handbook says. Cool. At that point, I'm leaving to go file a complaint. 100%. I got it on film. 100%. Because I support the police. I do not support bad police. I do not. So if, if as someone who has the experience to know better, I'm more than willing to to try to correct them in the interest of their own careers, of that the police department's, um, you know, how the public views them, and then, you know, how the public is treated by those police. So I'm not... Because of I, I I find issues with the morality of I don't know if morality is right I just I would be uncomfortable harassing a police officer just because I was a police officer I don't want to be that guy I don't want to be that guy but if they decided to make it an issue because I was standing there calmly I'm gonna ask a few questions and if I think their answers are not unreasonable I will make sure that that is known I'm not gonna I'm not gonna scream at them and tell them they're wrong. But I'm going to say, I don't believe that is true. But I will comply with your instructions. Uh, I I don't agree with your instructions, but based on the fact that you are a police officer, I'm going to comply. And then I'd go to the police station. I wouldn't let them know I was going to the police station uh, because I don't want them to be like radio ahead and be like, hey, this guy is, is being real ridiculous, right? Because I don't want them to have that preconceived notion of who I am because that might affect how they interact with me. So I want to go there and say, your officer's doing this. Here's some footage. That's kind of weird, huh? Renton. I've been to Renton. Yes. Uh, I would say... Uh, all right, are these bad cops the ones who are incorrect? I would say that's a personal opinion. Is a cop bad because they make one mistake or is it a pattern of misconduct? Is their mistake reasonable or is it unreasonable? So if an officer is punching someone in the face who is... You know, handcuffed, not resisting. Well, that's a bad police officer. I don't care how many times they've done it. One time, that's a bad police officer. And I will be discussing that on this channel. Uh, we're going to go into... I'm going to finish a bunch of videos on sovereign citizens. I got a couple more on um, uh, auditors before we transfer, like, born sovereign citizens. From there, we're going to go into uh, public protests. I'm going to try to find myself some good public protests to get involved. Not to be protesting in, but definitely to film. Um... I mean, around the Seattle area, you got a lot of the, uh, a lot of weird protests going on, and some of them get a little violent. Certainly in the um, the Portland area has a history of some pretty intense protests. So, I'm going to try to get over there and film those, uh, and then after that, I'm going to go into police brutality. So I'm going to alternate. Here's a video of police that looks like they're doing the bad thing, but they're not, and here's a police officer that looks like they're doing the bad uh, a bad thing, and they are. So, if a police officer is wrong, and just needs a little bit of education because they've never encountered a certain type of situation before. All right, I wouldn't say they're a bad officer. I think that it needs to be corrected. And then no harm, no foul. Well, I mean, maybe some harm and foul. But um, if they can be taught, great. And that's my thing is if you are if you have a criminal record, I don't care. As long as you understand what you did wrong and are taking steps to fix it. But if you have a criminal record and continue to engage in criminal activities, that's when I have a problem with you, right? Same with police. If you're a police officer and you make a mistake, all right, well, we'll correct it. But if you continue to make that mistake, you're a bad cop. Get out of here, right? If you make a huge mistake, like uh, you, you pepper spray a dog because you don't like dogs, all right, get out, right? I hope you get criminally charged for that. <clears throat> but it, it really comes down to what... There, That's just why when people are like, here's a video of a police officer doing a bad thing, and I go, well, they're, you know, why, where's the rest of the story? Is you can't just say that's bad. Well, sometimes you can, but there are a lot of times where you need a lot more information before you determine if a police officer is bad. It, it's it gets kind of complicated. Uh, 
so if an officer said, you're wrong, you can't film me, would I think they're bad? No. I would think that they need retraining. And I would try to make sure that that happened. And I'd offer to help retrain and be involved in that. Because all I want, I mean, I think the purpose of these audits shouldn't just be to be like, look, these police are bad. It should be, let's help them be better. Right? Because if you see a problem, okay, cool. You know, point out there's a problem. But that's not going to do much until, unless you're actually also finding a way to address that problem and fix it. And I think that's something a lot of people don't do enough of is, you know, all right, I see that there's a problem. What can we do to improve it? So, yeah, if I mean, and you guys are talking about police officers lying. Uh, that, I, I have mixed feelings about that because I was trained to lie. But not in a way that, uh, violates your constitutional rights. There's a very specific way, and people love to bring this up because it is true. Police can lie to you in very, very specific ways. They can't lie to you in a way that would make you think that you, uh, or that would make you give up your constitutional rights. Uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. They cannot lie to you in a manner that would cause you to give up your constitutional rights without realizing it. So I can't say, oh, no, 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 you're not in trouble. That's why I'm not advising you of your rights when, in fact, I am asking incriminating questions when someone is detained. I can't do that. But, oh, I'm sorry, I am moving around a lot, aren't I? I'm getting a little antsy. I've been sitting here for for a while. Uh, Excuse me, I I mean to, yeah, two hours. get a little antsy when I've been sitting too long. Uh, Thanks for (laughs) pointing that out. Um... Where was I? I'm sorry. Um, let me move to the center of my screen. I was saying something before I got distracted. Uh, yeah, so lying. I can lie to someone in a manner that is not shocking to the conscience of a, a jury uh, and in a manner that would not cause an innocent person to incriminate themselves. So I was an investigator. I did a lot of uh, what is called uh, interviews and interrogation. So I'd put the person in the room. It was a nice room had a couch. It wasn't like that single light bulb hanging from the ceiling that you see in those old film noir things. But I'd sit them down and I'd be like, hey, bud. And I'd be real nice. Hey. I read your case. Looked into what you did. It's not looking great. Uh, especially with the uh, the footage. Well, what what footage? Oh, well, when you, when you robbed that store, the store across the street had a security camera. Saw you doing it. Now, what if I don't have that footage? What if that's a lie? I can lie to them like that. Because an innocent person who knows that they didn't rob a store or what engage in criminal activity that would have been picked up by a camera is going to go, nah, dude, I didn't do that. You don't have that footage. They're going to know immediately that there is no footage. But a guilty person is going to question whether or not that footage exists. And so if I can get them to admit to their crimes by saying that evidence exists when it doesn't, that has been upheld in court because an innocent person would not be convinced to testify based on made up evidence. Uh, now, I can't go, I can't like create evidence and say, look, here's doctored photos of you. I cannot do that. I can imply that there is, that we have more evidence than we do. It's, it, it, but we have to be very cautious about it because if I go too far, and I'm very cautious about this. If I go too far and I say something like, well, if you don't confess to me, your children will be without a father or a mother or I'll make sure you go in prison forever. Well, that can cause an innocent person to uh, give up their, you know, to confess to a crime they didn't commit to defend their family. I cannot do that. That is super illegal. I know it's, it, it doesn't make much sense. It doesn't make much sense. It's, it's very complicated. I'm trying to give a... a, a Simplified version of very complicated things. So, uh, it's... Let me see if I can break it down. I can lie to a person to a very limited degree. I cannot do it in a manner that would cause them to, to confess to a crime that they did not commit. So I can't say... I can't make promises. I can't say that, um, you know, I'm going to go after their family members if they don't confess. Because that might make cause them to make a false confession uh, to protect their family, but I can say things like, "Well, we believe you did it based on, uh, based on, you know, some fingerprints we collected. We collected some fingerprints, and we're analyzing some video evidence right now. Is there a reason to believe that, you know, there? Would be, do you think that those fingerprints might come back to you, right? And 
you know, there might be no fingerprints. There might be no footage. But I can say, we're analyzing this data. We've collected a bunch of evidence. Uh, is there, is, do you have any reason to think that that evidence is going to point to you? And then I'm going to watch them. I don't really want an answer, but I'm going to watch them. So if they, if they sort of hunker down, if their knees go together, their feet start pointing towards the door, there are all these, these tells, right? Um, these simple things that people react. Uh, people like to say, oh, the way they look. I didn't, I didn't pay too much attention to the way they look. That's a little... I, I went for the bigger indicators. And all I'm trying to do is look for indicators of deception. I'm not trying to convince them to lie to me. I'm trying to get them to react in a way that I know a person who's trying to be deceptive will react to information that they think will break apart their entire story. So it's, 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 it's very tricky. And I was trained, I had specific training on that to make sure I don't violate people's rights with it. Uh, so the idea that police can, can lie, yes, that's true, but it's very, very limited. Um, and I'm not going to go into too many details because I don't want to give you guys all the secrets. You can look it up yourself. If you look into, um, uh, you know, how, I mean, it's it's not like it's a secret. I'm just not going to, I don't want to be responsible for helping you guys commit crimes um, or get away with it. You know, do that on your own time. But it's, a guilty person is going to react differently than an innocent person when, fa when faced with information that may or may not be real. Because uh, an innocent person is going to know that, oh, ne fingerprints aren't going to come back to me. The video is not going to come back to me because I was never there. My fingerprints couldn't be there. That's impossible. So they're going to, they're not going to give those those guilty indicators. Um, oh, yeah, no. It, it, interrogation can be really frustrating. Uh, hall monitor. It can be, I mean, I try to be real friendly. That was my tactic is, is be your friend. If the police officer is trying to be your friend, Maybe they're just really friendly people, but they're probably not your friend. Pro tip. So, um, I had, I was, I was specifically, I worked in um, counter narcotics and general crimes investigations, Brian. Uh, not everyone gets that training. I was fortunate enough to get taken under the wing of a, of a CID agent, and they went through a, a ton of stuff with me. Um, but why am I not an investigator now? Well, I was an investigator with the, um, with the military, all right, I did, sorry, I'm moving around again, uh, I did six years as a 31 Bravo, that's military police, I did four, approximately four years uh, in uh, investigations, and so I never intended to join the military for 20 years, I did my six years, I did five years, did an extra year, because uh, I re-enlisted around four years, and they just tacked on an extra year to that, um, I did six years and decided, eh, I don't really care for the military lifestyle anymore, uh, and right now, I have a different job. I'm not working directly in investigations. I do work a similar job. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail because people have tried to use my personal information to attack me before. Uh, I had a video where I interviewed a, a, a military police officer uh, who I had worked with. And people found out who he was um, and started calling the base that he was at. Uh, to try to get to me through him and try to get him fired. It didn't work. It, they, nothing came out of it. The base is like, hey, can you just remove that video? We're tired of getting these phone calls. I went, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you too much about what I do for work uh, because I don't want that to happen again. I don't want my work to be like, we're getting these phone calls. You're fired, right? I don't want that. So uh, CID is equal to NCIS and OSI. OSI being Air Force Federal Agency, NCIS being uh, the Naval Federal Agency, and CID being the Army Federal Agency. Um... I will not show you my ID because it's my name is on it. Uh, I could... One of these days I could show you a badge. But anyone... I mean, the badge does nothing because anyone can get it. It's not a, a um, controlled badge. It's available to anyone. So it the fact that I have it isn't going to... Isn't going to prove my point at all. Uh, I could show it to you guys sometime. But... Yeah, no, it's... N NCIS did it when you weren't even Navy. It's well, NCIS generally has jurisdiction over anything with a naval military nexus. So anything involved with the Navy, they can get involved in. Uh, which is, I was saying earlier that some people have um, subject matter jurisdiction. That would be what uh, NCIS has. NCIS is civilian, so um, it's if it's related in any way to the Navy, they they can step in for the most part. Um, yeah, and you're right, Hard See, it's it's a lot of white lies, more or less. I, I don't do anything hard. I, again, I can't make promises. I can't say, if you confess, I promise to reduce your sentences. I can say things like, if you confess, it's going to look a lot better to the DA, 
and I can put in a good word for you. Uh, if they ask about you, I can say, yeah, you were super cooperative. I can't. I can't say that. Go reduce your sentence. But, I mean, it's going to look good for you. I can say stuff like that. I can't make any promises um, as far as the, the lying thing goes. CGIS. CGIS is... Um, what is CGIS? Hold on. I, I'm going in depth here. CGIS. Center for Global Intercultural... No, that's not it. Oh, Coast Guard. Yeah, Coast Guard Investigative Services. Of course. Coast Guard is not a real branch. Well, not under the Department of Defense. Uh, they are under Department Department of Homeland Security now, I think. Uh, are those U.S. Investigative Services clearance investigators? Clear oh, the clearance investigators. Um, I actually don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think they are, but just not acting in a law enforcement capacity. But I don't actually know. I, I know what you're, you're asking. The people who, I assume I do, that are, um, that do, uh, invest, they investigate various things to determine, uh, whether or not you can get a clearance, like a secret or top secret clearance. Um, I don't know. I wish I could answer that. Uh, in, yeah, innocent people don't usually confess to something that they didn't do. Usually. But you have to be very careful. Because the last thing I want is to get someone to confess to a crime that they didn't do. And I've had people use that. Um, they said, like, hey, um, I didn't do this crime. But I I, I worry about fighting this. So I'm going to make a, a false confession. I said that straight to my face. It was like my second interview. And I just like, uh... Oh yeah, hold that thought. And I left. I went and got a special agent. And went. I don't know what to do. I I he, I don't want to get this guy to confess to something. And I was like brand new baby investigator, right? I was like, uh, you have experience. You're a federal agent. Uh, he's saying that he's gonna confess, but he didn't do it. He's gonna make a false confession. The agent went in there and just like ruined the dude, uh, and got him to confess. And he's like, I'm sorry, it wasn't a false confession. I really did it. Uh. <laughs> but I, I felt awkward because I'm like sitting in there with the with the agent. It's like, oh man, that, oh I should have thought of that. Like this guy is saying some really good stuff to get this guy to confess, and uh, basically telling him that he's an idiot because the evidence was against him. And uh, oh man, I learned a lot that day. I learned a lot that day. Uh, yeah, if they do confess and they're innocent, they could claim coercion. Uh, the first time I ever put a man in prison for murder, oh, it was. It was they drop it down to negligent homicide. Uh, he claimed coercion. I um, this was in Germany. Oh man, this was a, a, such a fun case. It was a huge case, it was a huge drug case. We must have had like almost twenty people involved, and bases in Germany are pretty small. So that's a really big deal. It's like half of a company. Um, it's small for a company. Companies are usually around ninety people uh, in the military, but this was this was a smaller one because small German bases. And we had so many people involved. We have German citizens. We had soldiers. We had, oh, my God. And um, during the investigation, one of our main suspects uh, was late to PT, physical training. And he was driving to work from off base. And he, uh, he crashed into a German and killed them by accident. Um, and he, he was charged with uh, negligent homicide or vehicular manslaughter, one of the two. And uh, since I was investigating him at the time, sorry, I'm writing something down. Uh, I was investigating him at the time for drugs. They decided to combine the two cases. And so when they actually charged him like two years later, which by the way, I'd forgotten most of the 200-page the case, um, they brought me in. They flew me to Germany. And... Uh, you know, I spent my, my flight just going over this case. I'm sure the person sitting next to me was like, what is this? You know, as I have, like, pictures of people behind bars. I'm like, okay, I'm not this guy, I'm not that guy. Uh, so I get there, and the lawyer basically said, like, you didn't film the interview, and therefore you coerced him. I'm like, what? No, like, we don't have to film the interview. He goes, well, then why didn't you? I'm like, because I specifically asked my boss, and he said, no, we don't film drug crimes. It was, well, this guy made two statements. One statement was that he did drugs, and the second statement was that he didn't do drugs, or that he sold drugs, right? Uh, his first statement was that he sold drugs but didn't do them. And he fully confessed to everything. And then he tested positive on your analysis, and then uh, I brought him back in and said, hey, bud, you said he didn't, didn't do drugs. You clearly have. And he's like, oh, my lawyer told me 
to, to not say anything to you. By the way, everything I said in the first one was a lie. Uh, I'm like, cool, well, one of these is a, a false official confession, which is a crime. Because I don't care. That's what my lawyer told me to do. I'm like, I'm pretty sure your lawyer didn't tell you to do that. But okay, we'll write that down. So in court, the his attorney was like, uh, yeah, so he has two different statements. The first one, he definitely coerced him. Definitely coerced him. Because the second one, he says he's innocent. I'm like, mm, no, uh, no, I had a, we had a witness. We had someone behind the glass making sure that I didn't do anything improper. He goes, well, when he wrote his, his, well, let me back up. I said, in his original statement, he said he was looking for marijuana, didn't find it, so he started like, selling spice instead. Well, you coerced that. You, you threatened him. He was intimidated by your presence. I'm like, he wasn't intimidated by my presence. Uh, I was outside of the room. When I give him that paperwork and say, hey, type out your statement, or sorry, when I gave him the computer, we had a computer at the time. I gave him the computer and said, type out your statement. I left the room so that he wouldn't be intimidated. I went behind the glass, watched him. When he sat away from the computer, I went back in. And the <laughs> attorney's like, he only wrote two sentences. I'm going, I guess I wasn't gone for very long then. And it was just, like, I don't know what to tell you, dude. He confessed to it, was told by an attorney that he shouldn't have confessed to it, and then tried to take it all back. He got convicted. He, he served time in prison for that one. Um, so yeah, no, people do confess and then try in court to claim false coercion. They tried that on me. And I basically was like, no, the amount of, of evidence, like he, his testimony led to like five other arrests. There's no way it's a false confession because these people also confirmed that he was selling to them after he ratted them out. So I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so no, it does happen. It's something that we definitely have to be very cautious about. Um, this would have been, what year? Oh, I think the investigation started 2014 or 15. And I probably went to Germany around 2017. I, maybe. Maybe that's, why are prisoners not allowed to salute? That's a good question. Um, I think it's because saluting is a sign of respect. And when you're, you've been convicted of a crime, you're being held in prison, like your salute means nothing. So you don't salute an officer because it's just incredibly disrespectful. Uh, and since soldiers are still subject to the UCMJ, they have been issued a lawful order like "do not salute." And if they do that, then it's a criminal act. I think I've never gone into depth because I was never I never worked corrections, uh, which is where that would apply. I've never seen a prisoner actually give a salute. I remember vaguely that someone has brought that up to me before, but I'm pretty sure it's because a salute is a sign of respect, and a convict can't give that respect. And so they're ordered not to do it. Or, no, 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 it's that you don't salute an officer who has been arrested. I do know you don't do that because they don't deserve your respect. I'm fairly certain. That sounds right. Anyway. Anyway. But yeah, speaking of, like, yeah, uh, inmates were so good at lying that we believed they were innocent. There are people that I'm fairly certain were guilty, and I just was like, if you told a good story and the evidence isn't isn't strong enough against you, so I'm not going to continue pursuing this because, I mean, once the crime is really bad and there's really good evidence against them, cool, I'll pursue it all day. But I'm I'm not going to violate someone's rights because I want to win. Absolutely not. I want them to win. I want them to beat me. I don't want them to beat me because I'm bad, but I want them to beat me because they're innocent, right? And so I would tell people like, look, here's what you may want to do for your legal defense is look into these things. Bring it up in court, because if I'm wrong, I want you to prove that. I want you to prove that I'm wrong. But if I'm right, I hope you go to jail for beating up your wife. Just a heads up. Did anyone ever ask me to produce my oath? Uh, no. No, I honestly... Uh, because we, we do our oath as soldiers uh, in MEPS. So we, we swear an oath, you know, we do the whole, like, yes, I swear to the Constitution. So every soldier has an oath. Uh, that they swear, and the oath is is guys, it's the oath is sort of meaningless. It's just like a the Hippocratic oath that uh, doctors do. It's oh, I promise to do this, and then if you don't do it, you can get fired. But it's not like you're going to go to jail for violating that oath, unless the thing that you violated, that violated the oath, is a criminal offense. So um, th th no, no one's ever asked me to produce my my oath uh, while I was law enforcement. They have after I I stopped being law enforcement. Uh, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you guys. I don't have an, an oath that I carry around with me. If you want to look up the oath at all, 
people joining the military make yeah, go go for it <laughs> that's the one um <clears throat> are military correctional facilities dangerous uh it's do you swear twice i mean this was like seven years ago so you know what do i remember um there might have been a military police oath I don't know. All right, so are, are military corrections facilities dangerous? Not the one I was ever near. Uh, the last base I was on had one. For mi- it was minimum security, and people were super chill. Some dangerous people in there, but mm, super chill. Uh, I mean, they got, like, Xboxes. They had a garden. It was just like, you screwed up. We're not, we're not going to, you know. <laughs> I should make an oath out of construction paper. Um, Leavenworth is the big military prison, and there are some real dangerous people there. But apparently it's really not that bad. Uh, soldiers are used to structure, so the prison is, is no different. And everyone in there can kill you. So, <laughs> has been trained to kill. So I think people sort of keep to themselves a little bit better. And I don't think there's as much racial stuff. I know in prisons, you know, people often, from what I understand, segregate by skin color. The, the, the military is nice because it's so, it's such a melting pot. I don't know if that's a big issue. But when there is an issue, there's an issue. So I know the corrections officers are, are trained in all sorts of stuff. And I know a few of them that have some pretty good stories. But I think it's less dangerous, honestly, than most civilian prisons uh, of equivalent um, you know, levels of, of security. The castle. I don't know about the castle. Well, Brian B., I mean... I, I don't. I don't remember. I swear. I mean, I remember swearing um, in maps. I don't remember swearing. I mean, military police oath. Did I have to swear to this? I mean, there's the United States Uniformed Service oath of office type thing. Um, so that I remember doing. I don't remember a specific one for military police. And I. I oh, there is an oath. Here, hold on. I guess there was, wasn't there? You know, I probably did upon graduation. But that was seven years ago, and it was never important to me because I never intended to break the oath. So. Hold on. I'm trying to figure out what you guys are asking me. BOP prison? BOP prison. Acronyms. Acronyms, acronyms, acronyms. Uh, oh, the castle was a Robert Redford movie. You're right. Uh, oh, yeah, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Uh, well, they tried to hire me, actually. Uh, I told them, eh. Um, I think the the Federal Bureau of Prisons, those prisons are a little more intense. Uh, because the people that commit federal crimes, I mean, com- federal crimes are often a, a bigger deal. Um, so I would say the federal prisons are, are a bit worse. Yeah, normal corrections facilities are more drugs in 10 square city blocks. It's You can sneak things in if you know what you're doing. That doesn't surprise me at all. It's, yeah, the amount of contraband. Oh, no, if you break the oath, that's, that's a big problem, especially since you're subject to the UCMJ. Uh, but civilian officers breaking the oath, if the thing that broke the oath isn't a criminal act, I mean, it's, I think it's more of a, you get fired, have a nice day. You know, uh, I've ne- I'm, I've looked. I've looked for the criminal repercussions of violating the oath. And outside of, like, the specific things that would be a violation, I don't I don't think it's a criminal act. It's just that if you break it, they can fire you, and you have no legal repercussions. So. But anyway, I should probably get out of here, guys. I have to go eat. Um, there are other people. Yeah, Chelsea Manning. Don't even get me started with this. Uh, the complications of Chelsea Manning, and I'm not. I'm not saying I'm for or against what happened. Just I spent a lot of time looking into it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give my opinion on that at the moment. <clears throat> anyway, I gotta get out of here. I promised uh, some people in my life that I'd be done soon, and then kept going forever. So you know, two and a half hours. Uh, I'd say we did well. I'd say that was a lot of fun. Uh, Oh, thank you, Nasty Nathaniel. I appreciate that. I, I, I tell you, not many people told me that when I was enforcing law on them. <laughs> yeah, a lot of insults thrown my way. All right. See you guys later. Until the next time, be good and stay safe.